In all humility, we have to say that we know with the concept of narcissism that all human beings have latent narcissism. We all have it in us. And maybe the temptation is there is to just do something messed up because it's too structured, it's too stable, you're too high, and you want to do something that is risky that could potentially not just ruin your career, but your marriage, your whole life. If you look at like the Hugh Edwards thing, I, I just think, what what is this? It's such high risk behavior for so little reward. What's he gonna get? What the judgment is, because it's it's socially based, is you're awful. Every environment you go into, you leave a stink behind and you make everybody feel used and exploited. It would have been enormously easy to, to manipulate him into the position that he's in now for her and uh, low risk and high reward. So she is a smart psychopath. My sense of evil was more to do with, with men and crime. Psychopathic men doing, that's evil. And then I was like, oh, there's a different kind of evil that can come inside of family units, that can come through girlfriends, boyfriends, husband, wives, that's coming through the avenue of love. And she'd confused me with her ex-boyfriend and she was standing over me within four minutes, screaming at me and talking to me as though I was somebody else. When she went into a strong emotional flashback, she did actually lose her grip of reality. And she would, she would shake, like her lips would turn white and she, was, she would shake and her voice would sound very, very strange. She had blue eyes, but they would go very, very dark. He's gonna spew out <laughs> 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 It is with great delight I bring back to the channel Richard Grannon, you may have saw him on the live, but this is the first sit down we've done in years. The first one he did went viral with all the little clips on the royal family, Harry, Meghan. We are going to be covering some of that content today, but we're also going to get into the TV presenters, the narcissism of, and psychopathy of the likes of Hugh Edwards, uh, Philip Schofield, etc., and everything that is currently being talked about. The other stuff that we talked about last time, we're now banned from talking about on this channel, Who Killed E? So we won't be going down that road today. Now, Richard's got his own channel. Link is in the description box. He's got his book, A Cult of One. If you want to join his cult, follow him on Instagram. His Instagram link will be down there as well. And huge thank you for coming back, my friend. Thank Definitely. you very much. Pleasure to be back with you again, sir. Yeah. And we, you know, you came on the live the other night. We were talking about Hugh Edwards. Yes. With the recent scandals in the media, Dan, mm -hmm. what are the psychodynamics behind these characters who have got massive followings mm. they've been investing in their careers for decades mm. they're at the top of the game i mean edwards was he was the man at the bbc mm. he was supposed to personify these values that the bbc has on their web page this mission statement trust yeah. is one of them yeah. what possesses someone like that to allegedly get on a webcam and ask a 17 year old to show them their bits i think you know, like in, in all humility, we have to say that we know with the concept of narcissism that all human beings have latent narcissism. We all have it in us. Um, it's a necessary part of our development. You're supposed to go into narcissism and then grow out of it by the time you're four or five years old. So it's there. And there is this effect uh, that some clinicians acknowledge. It's a bit controversial. Some people say it's not real. I, I suspect it's real. It's context-specific narcissism. So dependent on the lifestyle you're living, maybe the latent narcissism inside of any of us would be provoked. And I just can't imagine what it would be like to, to live at, at that level and to live that lifestyle day in, day out, being that person. And maybe you just get a bit numb to it and a bit cocky and start to feel like nothing can touch you. And maybe the temptation is there is to just do something messed up because it's too structured, it's too stable, you're too high and you want to do something that is risky that could potentially not just ruin your career, but your marriage, your whole life. 
And uh, I think that's a very human thing in us, you know, even even success can be overwhelming, maybe even sometimes more overwhelming than failure can be. And that, that can provoke that narcissistic uh, drive inside of us, I think. But why was there no stopping point for them? Well, the thing with narcissism, it's a really good question. The thing with narcissism, if we go back to the, the notion of latent, sometimes called healthy narcissism, you should go through that when you're like three, four years old. Now you think about a three or four year old when you were three or four, when I was three or four. If you went into a rage when you were three, that's a boundaryless rage. You don't know what, it's not like you sat there going, I don't think I ate enough today, or you know, I'm having a bad day, I need to calm down. You become rage. If you experience envy, you become envy. You're just this little entity with no boundaries, with no proper ego boundaries, and all of the emotions you feel would be completely real and all consuming in that moment. And these are very primal emotions. That's all a three or four year old can access. So I hypothesize that if an adult gets into a, a context that provokes narcissism and their latent narcissism is provoked, they regress into an infantile state. Now, I think I can back that because if you look, the decisions they're making, they're not adult decisions. They're extremely impulsive and they're usually rooted in something quite base, sex or addiction or drugs. And they want to do something destructive. They see the Lego castle that the kid brother has made and they just want to kick it all down just because. So narcissism then has to be understood as something infantile. It's childlike. And that's why there's no, like as an adult, you'd be like, okay, I think, I think I've pushed this as far as I can. But as a child in that narcissistic state, no, you go and go and go until you hit a boundary and there's no internal boundaries. There's no internal boundaries. It has to be an external boundary. It has to come from an authority figure, mummy or daddy, or an institute in this case is the BBC is like saying, you're not doing that anymore. No. And are there higher levels of narcissism? Because to do something like that to your family, mm. of course, I think you have to be extremely selfish and obviously a, a high level narcissist mm. uh, compared to the mere mortal. Mm. Do, would you say the media somewhat gives them that, that upper step into narcissism it it could do i think the capacity to do something selfish that is gonna potentially hurt the people around you is accessible to all of us i don't think you need to be in the media to do that we all we've all either done it or everybody in this room will be one or two steps away from someone who has done it in their lives like and you you can sit with them and you say why did you do that well you know did you not know how your wife, your husband would feel, your kids. Do you, and they'll, they'll, just, they'll just cry or they'll look a bit sad and they'll go, yeah, I did, but I did it anyway. So I think the more, the more sort of human approach to this is say, okay, how does, how does that person get there? Can I put myself in their shoes? Because I'm trying to do it. Because I look at it and I go, well, that's effing stupid. What should you do that? And I go, okay, okay, Richard, just for a second. Can you be them? Can you live in their shoes and just and just imagine what it's like? Like, what what are you doing? What's the point? Are you bored? Is life too good? Do you need some chaos? Do you because if you look at like the Hugh Edwards thing, I I just think what what is this? It's such high risk behavior for so little reward. What's he gonna get? A picture he can have a crafty wank over. I mean, for <laughs> a, 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 a such high risk to ruin your life. It's not like he he was he was it was a honeypot situation. He fell in love with some amazing Russian spy or something and then went <laughs> off with her. He's asking for a picture of and you just think that there's I I don't know him. I've not sat with him, but I try and look contextually and take the human view and I just think that is somebody who it is narcissism, but it's it's a kind of a self-destructive narcissism. I life is too good. Let me ruin things. And that leads me to what are your thoughts on his reaction to being caught out by sending his wife out to the media for him and uh, playing the mental health route? Um, I, I don't know whether that's his decision or whether he's got the money and resources and contacts to hire somebody to do that for him because it does look like a, a pretty smart PR move. Um, if it's him or a smart PR move, there is a goal-orientated psychopathic highly manipulative element to that. And look, there could be an element of truth. There could be pre-existing mental health problems. The thing is for a guy like me and my position with my philosophical political outlook, I don't like 
when people say, because I have a mental health issue, it's okay for me to do a criminal thing or an immoral thing. There is no mental health issue aside from full scale schizophrenia where you're just riddled with delusion that should permit a person to say, oh, this is why I did a criminal or immoral thing. Anxiety, depression, a personality disorder. You still have an element of control. Um, I, I think we're in a cultural moment where people are hiding behind mental health. It can't be an excuse for not studying for your exams. It can't be an excuse for evading your taxes or cheating on your wife. Or it, It's becoming a bin that people throw everything in. And yet, I'm sure he is feeling. I mean, previously, they wouldn't have called it a mental health issue. They would have just said he's very stressed. I'm sure he is. It's a horrible situation to be in. If I put, again, I try and imagine being him. He's probably not sleeping very much. He's probably shaking all the time. He's, his, his central nervous system will be constantly activated, which is exhausting. He will be under an enormous amount of pressure right now. Well, we saw the same thing with Schofield. He ended up going down the mental health route. And we also saw that the young people in both those cases ended up with really high-priced lawyers, mm -hmm. which possibly could have been paid by the alleged perpetrators. Yes. So we've seen parallels in both of the cases. And do you think then, you said that earlier on, you said that narcissism is in everyone to yeah. a different degree. Yeah. When it gets to acting out in extreme behavior then, is that a function of childhood trauma? I'm trying to get to the root cause of it. Would these guys have had more childhood trauma than most of us to behave in this extreme manner? We know that people who end up in the public eye, uh, based on the research, based on the published data that's out there that people can check, it's no surprise to anybody that if you're in the public eye, you and I included, if we go and do a test, we will probably be above baseline for narcissism. We, because you've got to want to be seen. You've got, to, you know, you've, got to, you've got to have the entitlement to say, no, I've got something to say. I should be in the limelight. I should be in the public eye. There is a world of difference, however, between saying somebody is rating highly for trait narcissism and somebody has narcissistic personality disorder. Narcissistic personality disorder is another planet entirely. You're still a flexible, uh, open to feedback human being if you're ranking very highly for trait narcissism. So um, the more extreme behavior, I'd need to know case by case. So, so yes, it could just be that the person's ranking very highly for trait narcissism. In, in a person who doesn't have narcissistic personality disorder, it's probably other traits that are making them do something extreme. You're probably looking at some of the psychopathic traits like low impulse control. What I'm seeing is a lot, generally speaking, is a lot of self-destructiveness. A lot of people who just want to ruin their own lives. I mean, and that's, that's a whole other conversation. If it's very extreme behavior, then yes, it could be narcissistic personality disorder. Why would that happen? Because narcissistic personality disorder is an infantile disorder of um, grandiosity and delusion where the person has had a total break from reality. So they live in a delusional world. In many ways, it's akin to a kind of schizophrenia. And that protects them because they went through trauma? The type of, tra the type of trauma, so it's, it, it, again, this is, I can't speak for the orthodoxy, I speak for my opinion. Some people agree, some people don't. To me, it's the type of trauma that the child experienced and the genetic predisposition of the child in response to that trauma. Typically, narcissistic personality disorder specifically requires a polarity in which the child is being abused and simultaneously being told, you're the worst thing imaginable on earth, nothing you ever do is right, you're the scum of the earth or worse, and they're also getting a signal, you're an angelic, godlike being and you are perfect and in that confusion the personality splits so next question is you said that there was no reward and it was all risk is there such a personality type whereby the prospect of losing everything is the reward because that's getting their rocks off Yes, absolutely. And you spent some of your time with them in Arizona. <laughs> uh, they, they are called psychopaths. And, and, and our notion of, of, a, of a psychopath uh, for the world is, is absolutely historically rooted in the American penal system. And people have tried to argue this with me. It is absolutely inarguably true that orthodox psychology mainstream view of psychopathy is an American concept and it's specifically the standard or the mean statistically of the American penal system in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, which is why it's a changing concept because it doesn't, it doesn't always apply as much today. It's an issue that 
we're, we're arguing over. There's a big there's a big debate about it. But yes, in psychopathy, there is a fearlessness. There is a desire for risk. These are not necessarily like low IQ people. You can have high IQ psychopaths and you can say to them, do you know what the risk is of this? And they'll be like, yeah, I do. <laughs> it's great. And they love that. That was the point, wasn't it? <laughs> Sounds like wild man. <laughs> so yeah, there is the, that we're away from narcissism and we're more towards psychopathy there. But of course, narcissism is very frequently comorbid with psychopathy. They're frequently diagnosed together. With these TV presenters then, would you say there's a bit of both? I don't, I don't, because I've not met them and because I've not spoken to them, I don't want to be the guy who's like, oh, I'm into narcissism, psychopathy, narcissist, psychopath, narcissist, psychopath. But, <laughs> but seeing as you're asking, um, it, if, if you said to me, okay, you have to view this through a narcissistic, psychopathic lens, does this match? And I would say, yeah, yeah, okay. Let's assume as if, as a, just as a philosophical experiment that it matches and that I agree. How does it match? Uh, high risk, low reward scenarios. Um, uh, uh, there's an obsessive element to this. You know, you're, if I took any, either of these men out of the, of the situation and just said to them as like quietly, privately as a therapist, what do you hope to gain here? What, what is this? And they were told, oh, like sexual fulfillment. Really? Uh, tell me about sexual fulfillment. What, you know, elucidate that. Explain to me the, the what is the end of this fantasy? Because you're running a fantasy. How does this end? What's the perfect scenario? What are we doing? They wouldn't be able to answer because they're trapped. And I think this is a narcissistic, psych, narcissistic psychopathic problem specifically is to get obsessed with a particular way of gratifying your needs and achieving success that is fantasy based can't be realized can't well, be realized why can't they go on ph like everybody else in the world uh, yeah or uh, do you, do you, oh, ph is the, ah yes oh, see, <laughs> yeah, i am no. so clean i didn't know what you were referring to there for <laughs> a second no you do the, the special site <laughs> you know, yeah yeah well i mean there's i think i think this is Again, to take the human view, I think a lot of fantasy functions this way, not to drift off into psychoanalytic theory too much, but there's a guy I follow who's a Freudian, he's Slovenian, he's called Slavoj Žižek. And he would say that the point of fantasy is you can never fulfill it, you don't want to. The fulfillment of fantasy is the beginning of depression. You want to maintain the fantasy. So you said, where do you see the narcissistic psychopathy? And I say, this seems like fantasy-based behavior. Like, what are you really doing? What, what... How do you fulfill this? And the point is not to fulfill it. The point is to just kick the can down the road and to desire, desire for its own sake. And how can you tell the difference between, the clear difference between a psychopath and a narcissist? You can't. You can't. There'll be, there'll be people who claim you can. Um, by the by, the DSM-5 definition that I largely use, which is which is voted into existence, as I'm sure you know, by the American Psychiatric Association. They just agree. There's no blood tests for this. There's no brain scans for it. They just go, oh, we think it's this. Um, there are different tests, but they very, very frequently cross over because fundamentally uh, psychopathy in its original historical form was a way of saying, look, this is a kind of moral degeneracy, which we can't talk today. You're not allowed to say moral degeneracy in the in the, psycho in the psychology uh, clinic because it should be an amoral scenario, but it is a form of moral degeneracy. These are people who lack a moral core. So you were talking about narcissists and psychopaths, the difficulty in identifying them. Mm. So living with the psychopaths then, one thing I noticed is there's an intimidating level of they have no fear. Yeah. Do the narcissists have that or some of the narcissist pussies? Uh, some of the narcissists are pussies and that that can be it's one of these things that it makes it a little bit confusing so if you have a narcissistic psychopath maybe one of the things that's happening is they're switching between states so if you get them on one day you might have like um it's quite common for narcissists to be hypochondriacs so they'll be very very defensive of themselves they mustn't touch this they mustn't they're allergic to everything blah blah and uh and then the next day they're ready to jump in a car, take a sawn off shotgun and go and poke it in somebody's nose. And you think, oh, did you clean that sawn off before you, you know, <laughs> they don't care when they've flipped the switch. And so the difficulty now is, is in psychology because we've 
it has been observed so many times. Are these really fixed personality disorders? <laughs> or are these like post-traumatic stress responses almost like alters, you know, dissociative identity, multiple personality disorder. People switch between different personalities. Love that movie, Split. The Split, yeah, Split is a good one. And so you've got the narcissist would be, uh, uh, let's say, let's make him up. He's like a grandiose hypochondriac. He's above everybody and he's an intellectual, but he flips and he's super scared of the world and he hides in his books and he has this delusional version of himself. Flip psychopath, somebody pushes his buttons in the wrong way. And he's capable of intense violence for short periods of time. So what is he then? Because his actions have now fallen outside of our definition of MPD. Because an MPD typically wouldn't be violent because they're very conscious of their reputation. They're very conscious of how they look. They'll do emotional violence. These are the people who'll call you up and say you're a piece of shit, but they won't text you you're a piece of shit because they don't want the evidence there. They don't, they don't want it seen. So they're quite careful. Psychopath, couldn't care less. They'll go all the way. All the way, all and the way. And you're so experienced in this subject. Can you remember the first time you came in counter with a narcissist? Uh, when I saw my father when I was born and said, hello, father. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 he, he, yeah, he went, he went to prison for the things he did. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, he did a, did a long stretch, yeah. Bad man, really, really bad man. The, the narcissism and psychopathy and borderline personality disorder um, I personally feel is very prevalent where we're from in the Northwest. I think a lot of this Irish immigrant working class population that were financially on the top of the world for a couple of centuries because of the slave trade, you know, we were the second London, produced a ton of nouveau riche billionaires by today's standards, not just millionaires. And then when the slave trade died and the shipping died, it all went and it left a cultural trauma there that has left the, I, you know, people don't like me saying it, obviously, but I don't give a shit. The Northwest, like scousers in the surrounding areas, people from the world, people where witness. you're from, witness, chip on the shoulder, big, big chip on the shoulder. They'll pretend that they're working class salt of the earth, but they cannot wait to stab the mates in the back just to buy that Ferrari or sell some more Coke or, or, or do whatever it takes to get ahead. So narcissism and psychopathy is, I think it's rife where we're from. So yeah, in my family, I saw it. But Gotta be father, careful, I don't want to have a backlash from the people of witness. I saying, love the people of witness I and they are the salt of the earth. All of you, please don't harass me when I'm walking down Liverpool High Street. Witness massive. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so because I'm a southerner, I'm a better person, I'm less likely to be a narcissist. Well, that's a whole other issue. <laughs> Let's not get too far. <laughs> Who's the bigger narcissist, me or Jen? Oh my God, right. Joking. I, right, I Richard, like to, so, so. No, no, so. I don't want to leave you. I'm leaving a massive <laughs> argument behind me. <laughs> no, I would like to. Jen's got out. pregnancy hormones kicking in. This is not a good road to go down. <laughs> you did this to me. <laughs> we in my life. Um, no, when before actually, this is quite an interesting one. Two and a half years ago, when I first met Sean, he sat me down in his front room and made me do a psychopath test and a narcissist test online. You know what? Who am I who I'm working with? The BBC should have done this and they wouldn't be in the trouble they're in today. <laughs> <laughs> like it does that make him I think ahead. <laughs> He's gonna spew out <laughs> 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 He's holding on. <laughs> oh, my God. That's a cliff. That's a cliff right there. I'm going to get forehead sweat on there. It's like, come on, don't do this. Not live. Come on. Um, uh, how accurate are these tests? Uh, they, it, dep it depends. Now, you see, it depends on um, on how uh, honest you're being with the test. I mean, they're pretty easy to deceive. Like you can see a narcissism test a mile away and be like, do you love yourself and feel more entitled than other people? Yes, oh, you're a narcissist. They're pretty, there they're are they're a really, really good ones that you can't trick. But a lot of the ones you can find online, you you know what they're asking. I think I even played up on it to make it make it Worse. seem like I was more, yeah. 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 Psychopathic. Just out of spite for being so for forced. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Richard, I'm going to ask you the same question again. Mm. We, we like long answers on this channel. Mm -hmm. And I know you've got the story of the woman. And I've watched your, that video you've made several times. I've been mm. that fascinated by your mm. own personal story because we love personal stories on this mm. channel. Mm. Jen's not seen it. Can you explain what happened? With I'm the, guessing with, a past relationship. With, with my ex. Yours, yeah. 
Um, oh God! Uh, it depends on which one you, you're referring to. You said you, you spent two or three years with her, and it took two or three years to get over it. Oh, oh, that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, well, and oh, see now that that's partly that's partly my own fault. He said as a codependent, it was my fault that she abused me, of course, um, because. I was blending psychology and psychotherapy into the relationship. So when I met her, I knew that she was a refugee from a war zone, uh, it was Bosnia, and I knew that she came with PTSD. And so there was the fact that she was from a very different culture. She spoke a primary language, was a different language to mine, and uh, PTSD was in the mix. So a loss of bad behavior, um, that is, is just bad behavior, um, was dealt with as a psychotherapist, which is completely wrong. Psychotherapy really is great, and the psychotherapeutic coordinates are great only in therapy. So <clears throat> we talk safe spaces in therapy. We talk active listening. We talk uh, uh, honoring the client's subjective experience above all else. It's perfect in therapy. It doesn't belong in your hospital. It doesn't go in your bank. It shouldn't be in the military. All of that is a kind of psychologization of the world. And I psychologize my relationship. Um, I should have held a stronger boundary to say, you know, well, you have PTSD, you have mental health issues. You see a therapist. I am your boyfriend. That's it. And so it went on for too long. Before we get to that, hold on a sec. Go on. How did you meet this person? And what was the relationship like in the beginning? Um. I met her at one of my at one of my seminars in in London, and in the beginning, it was uh, she's a very very good looking girl, and I was thirty seven. She's uh, the best looking girl <laughs> I'd ever been with, and it was it was uh, it was great. It was a very sexual relationship. Um, and it was very, a very affectionate. She did a lot of mirroring. She figured out what she want, what I wanted to say to me. And she fed back into my own latent narcissism. She appealed to my uh, intellectual narcissism. She's a, she's a bright girl. So her background is uh, science. What kind of things would have been said then? Um, oh God. Uh, basically finding subtle and covert ways to validate my worldview. And whatever whatever I said, I think the world works like this, should be like, that's absolutely true. And you're probably a genius for thinking that. And I think, yes, yes, she's probably right. I probably am a genius of some sort. What so a, feeding what a the ego, girl. proper Total stroking. Ego feed. ego feed. How old were you when you met? She, I was 37, she was 28. And um, I had been through a, a bad relationship, but it was... So the the bad relationship that went before was much more obvious. Like anybody should have seen that coming. The girl was more histrionic. So more obviously openly sexual and flirtatious. This girl was conservative and she was an intellectual. So I was like, oh, this one's fine. She'll be, this is going to be, this is going to be different. And it it really wasn't. How Um, long was the honeymoon period? Honestly, not that long. Um, I think the first time she... I mean, I, 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 you can't analyze somebody you've lived with. You can't analyze your girlfriend. Um, I could see traits of histrionic, borderline, narcissism, psychopathy there, which is the full deck. That's called the dark tetrad. But what did she actually do to make you think that? <sighs> oh, God. <laughs> You're making him relive it. <laughs> uh, flashbacks. Um, one night, we were sat on the couch... See, my, my PTSD doesn't even allow me to remember this properly. Oh, we, we, were, we were sat on the couch, we were watching TV and I said something about somebody that was on the TV and she went into an argument that I realized years later was with her ex-boyfriend and she'd confused me with her ex-boyfriend and she was standing over me within four minutes screaming at me and talking to me as though I was somebody else. You got to remember, this is 11 o'clock at night and I love this girl. I think she's the best thing since sliced bread. And I'm looking at her like, what are you, what, what are you talking about? And who are you talking to? Like what? You're making references to things. I have no idea what's going on. So I do 
I do think, having said, I don't want to psychologize the relationship, I do think she did have quite severe PTSD and she was a bit delusional when she, sorry for hitting the mic, when she went into a strong emotional flashback, she did actually lose her grip of reality. And she would, she would shake, like her lips would turn white and she was, she would shake and her voice would sound very, very strange. She had blue eyes, but they would go very, very dark. Um, and you could see when she when she'd gone, she'd gone. There was no reasoning with her. Was that something she just cycled into, or were the triggers during the I day? I was going to say, was that, she under the influence during these? Uh, she had had uh, two glasses of wine, and you said, "Is there something during the day?" I didn't pick it up, but looking back, there must have been. I probably said or did something, or I did said or did completely innocuous things, and then her perception altered it to be like, oh, he's just rejected you, or he's just told you he loved his ex-girlfriend more than you, or he's just looked at that girl over there where probably I was looking at like a cake shop or something, <laughs> you know. <laughs> this is the kind of thing that happens in normal relationships. It's a perfectly normal thing to feel jealous, but if you're heavily emotionally dysregulated or carrying a personality disorder, that spike of jealousy, because the brain's HPA axis is dysregulated, so it's like a physical problem when people are highly traumatized, that's the hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenal gland axis, without turning this into a neurobiology lecture. Let's say it's like your threat assessment system. It's observably damaged in people who are highly traumatized. So that spike of jealousy, where you'd be like, what did you, what did you mean when you said that? And you can have like a normal conversation. Be like, oh, I meant this. Oh, okay. I thought you meant that. No, 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 no. I didn't mean that. And it's done. She would just sit there and go, oh, so you love your ex-girlfriend more than me, do you? But I didn't pick up on that. Her adrenaline would spike and spike and spike during the day. A couple of glasses of wine. I'd say something innocuous about something on the TV. Bang, she'd be, she'd be in the stratosphere and arguing maybe with her dad, maybe with her ex-boyfriend, maybe with who, who knows, who knows who she was arguing with, but it wasn't me. There were other incidents where she would begin arguments in the living room on her own while I was asleep with herself and then come in and start screaming at me halfway through an argument that she was having with her version of me in her head. So I would wake up at half four in the morning with a lunatic screaming, spitting in my face, because she was already 40 minutes into an argument with me. I'd be like, hang on, hang on, hang on. Just let me wake up <laughs> and catch up with where you're at. So yeah, I going, mean- Going back to the first argument, mm, the first incident, mm, yeah. how did you diffuse it? And when you had diffused it, did you just think that was a one-off at the time? Oh, you're asking good questions. I think I did manage to diffuse it um, through. I think I. I think I sort of like I lasted the round. I didn't do some amazing magical psychological trickery to stop her. I just endured. I just kept going, and then I think she burnt out, and I saw her come back from whatever psychotic episode she was having, and she started to see me again, and then I was. I made a joke, put some humor into it, and it calmed it down. But from that point on, that was only six weeks in, I had no excuse to do what I did next, which was I moved to Sweden and started living with her and got into a rental contract and financially did joined you thought that was a one-off? No, Sean. How many episodes no. did she have before you moved to Sweden? But four, five. I, 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 knew, I, knew that she was, I knew that she was mentally sick. I knew that she was mentally sick, but... I have my own issues, I had my own fantasy, I and I have my own obsessions. Like I really wanted to be with her. I thought that she was the perfect partner for me. So this is my own fantasy kicked in. So I started sweeping these things under the carpet and being like, oh, we can fix it. We can fix it with therapy, we'll fix it with time. We'll fix it with love. No, you won't, never think that. That's not what love is for. Um, and so, yeah, I, I went in knowing that it was gonna be a rough ride. And did the move to Sweden help? Did it calm down after Not that? Not at all. I knew you were going to say that. Not at all. Um, she then, she hates, her family fled Bosnia to Sweden. Sweden opened its doors uh, to, to Bosnian refugees during the Yugoslavian wars, during the Bosnian genocide. And um, she hated Sweden. She, she was bullied in Sweden. She was uh, called, a lot of her PTSD wasn't just from Bosnia. It was actually in Sweden. Uh, she was called a dirty, a um, obviously, being from Bosnia, um, there's, there's a different look, so people could identify her. She then spent the rest of her life trying to make herself look as Swedish as possible. 
with their dress code and dyeing a hair and all the rest of it. And I was like saying, so you don't need to do this, you know? So there was a, there was a big uh, split in her own self-image and, you know, all, all due respect to her, like life was really hard for her, really, really hard, but she didn't need a boyfriend. She needed therapy. And how did this come to an end? Hold on, let's let's not jump to the end. A There's a lot to this. <laughs> I've, I've, I'm I've, seeing some oh, serious. He's, look at he's his done, eyes. Look at his he's eyes. Done, <laughs> he's done an hour. He does an hour on this. Yeah, yeah. Is so, so, oh, <laughs> so Richard. I'm excited Richard, now. Richard, is it trauma bonding? Is, is it traumatizing? Yes, sure. Is it, it is. Go is on. it codependency, or is it both? The fact that you're going with this at, at this beginning of the relationship because it's three years, isn't it? Yeah, three years. We're only we're only six weeks in. Oh god! Don't well, jump to the end. Oh <laughs> god! Um, yeah. Uh, so, well, I was trauma bonded in the end because, um, and this is this will be useful for for the audience. I think like it's very confusing when you're in an abusive relationship. Intellectually, cognitively, you know the person's awful. And you can tell your mum what she's done. Your mum be like, "Wow, that's awful." And your and your mates are like, "Oh, that's awful." But you still want to talk to them, and they're still highly significant for you. And I think the reason is very, very simple. Um, the more somebody hurts you, the more your brain associates significance with that person. So the pain they cause you becomes commensurate with the significance they have in your life. That's trauma bonding. So absolutely, I was trauma bonded to her. Why didn't I say? this is not love. I want to be loved and respected. This is nonsense. I'll find somebody else. Yes, codependency. Yes, a lack of self-worth. Yes, uh, childhood trauma. All of these things that go into making the melange of, of codependency. Codependency is like a description of a pattern of, of behavior. It doesn't, it doesn't function as a, as a clinical entity. Um, there's something called dependent personality disorder, which is adjacent to it. But codependency is more of a pop psychology way of describing hyper submissive, excessively fawning patterns of behavior, typically inside of abusive relationships. You're just not saying no when you should be. But I mean, I had like my own childhood was very, very rough. I had loads of issues around attachment, loads of issues around women. And to a degree, I thought, well, this is a, this is what love is. And B, this is as good as it's ever going to get for me. Uh, yes, I'm being abused, but she's really hot and the sex is nice. <laughs> so during the first year then, what were the major events that happened with her? God. In the first year? Yeah. Uh, You're really buzzing off this, aren't you? <laughs> he loves oh, it. I mean, it's a, it's a true story, <laughs> isn't it? There's a lot of psychological jargon, but people relate to true stories because they give the lesson, I and think. And yet his eyes gleam. <laughs> 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 the change in colour as we speak, <laughs> going dark. <laughs> My ears are going pointy. <laughs> so the the first uh, three months, we were we were sort of like she was visiting me in the UK, I was visiting her in Sweden, and then we moved in together. Uh, that six months was a winter in Sweden, where she had to work, and she spent the last five years with an ex boyfriend without revealing too much, how would I say this? So so they were basically in a holiday type environment doing scientific work um, that permitted them to live in, they lived poor, but they had a great lifestyle and they were scientists doing science and publishing papers. So she was, I mean, that just doesn't exist. Most people who do a degree in biology are never, it's like people who do degrees in psychology. Most of us never do therapy. We'll never sit opposite a person and say, how does that make you feel? She hit the jackpot by attaching herself to a professor. So she didn't have to work. She had a high degree of entitlement. Then she met me, she'd finished with him, she'd come back to Sweden and she, she had to go work. And uh, I didn't know at the time what the problem was. She just hated working. She just hated going to work. And she had an office, it was a bureaucratic office job within a Swedish government body. And um, she loathed it, but she couldn't say I hate living a normal life. I feel entitled to more. She said, um, I'm depressed because the work I was doing, let's say they were studying grasshoppers. They weren't, but she says, I miss my grasshoppers. I miss all the research I did there. I set all of this grasshopper studying up for him in this country. Let's say it's Italy. And now he's enjoying the benefits of and I'm depressed. And I was like, oh, so it's grasshoppers you need. Yes. And then you won't be depressed. No. 
okay then, darling, I shall take you to a country and I will pay for you to live there and you can do grasshopper studying in a nice foreign country and do it voluntarily. Because as I say, there's no nobody's going to pay you to do this. It, like, nobody cares except scientists. There's no money. There's very, there's very little money in science. Um, and so that's what I did. I paid and took her to another country and said, okay, now volunteer and that's your job. You'll be happy now, won't you? No, that wasn't the problem. The problem was that she, she needed therapy. She was really, really mentally sick. So my ex subjective experience daily was to live with somebody who on the basis of either something I did. So the things I did, maybe there's things I did that were actually genuinely wrong or they were an innocuous and uh, perceived as being awful, or they just happened inside of her head. Um, and I cycled through that on a daily basis and I became fearful. And I lived with somebody who I was afraid of because if she went into a mood swing, she could be, maybe she would be silent with me for two days. Maybe she would start screaming at me. Maybe she would start throwing things around the house. She would even self-harm if she was enraged with me. One day she nearly cut off the tip of her thumb because she was so angry with me, but couldn't tell me that she was angry with me. How did that happen? Uh, she thrust her hand into uh, uh, the dry, what's the, the dishwasher with the knives were pointed upward and um, in a rage. And yeah, she nearly, uh, she, uh, and then, and then she wouldn't let me help her. She wouldn't let me stem the blood flow. She wouldn't let me take her to hospital. She just wanted to sit on the floor and cry and bleed with her, her, her thumb hanging off. Oh it was, it, and, and this, so I never knew when, when she would come in, I never knew what I was going to get. So I started to fear phone calls. I became fearful of my phone. That would give me adrenaline spike and the sound of the door opening would give me an adrenaline spike. And I, and I could hear myself fawning and trying to set up the environment and the interaction in such a way that she wouldn't go psychotic. It's a miserable, wretched life. You live, it's the life of a slave. How many months into the relationship were you when you, it was a daily, were you working on oh, yourself we'd, daily? We'd gotten to this as a daily routine by the fourth month. She fourth month? She wasn't pretending after month four. She wasn't fourth pretending. Yeah. And when did you notice it was starting to play a part in your mental health? Oh God, I put on, uh, it was my mum. My mum was laughing at me because I was so fat. I put on like, uh, by the fourth month. So by the December in Sweden, I'd gone up to 105 kilos. And when I got back from Spain in August, right before I met her of that year, so that's only like a four month difference. I think I'd put on, yeah, I'd put on like 15 kilos in about four months. Um, wasn't sleeping. My glands kept swelling up. If there was any flu in the environment, I would get it. And uh, yeah, my, my physical health went down the shitter rapidly. Because they say narcissists are like energy vampires. They will drain you of everything. Yeah, oh yeah, you'll, be, you'll become physically sick. There's a lot of, um, God, what is it called? Immune system disorders that I think we will find in time are absolutely positively correlated with narcissism. Because you're what you're doing, I think, to go a little bit esoteric for a moment, a bit of a hippie at heart, I think you're saying to yourself, don't defend yourself, let this happen. And it's almost like sending a signal to your body and the defense systems of your body, switch off, switch off, switch off, let it happen, let it happen. Instead of being like, no, there's a threat, fight it, stand up for yourself, say no, let's do this. You're saying, no, just be inert, let it happen. The safest thing is to be still and to freeze and maybe the predator will show you mercy today. And it kind of, Psychologically, you're doing it, and I suspect that's not science. Anything I just said—it's just my opinion. Like I think you're also sending a signal to your body: don't defend yourself. And all this has only happened on month four. Mm -hmm. What was month five like? Any better? God, it was a living hell. I—I I mean, I. Oh, she's a oh god. <laughs> She's a pro-social narcissist. So she's actually an animal rights activist and an environmental activist. But she bought uh, with her ex-boyfriend pure breed uh, dogs at 1,200 euros each from a breeder. And she was saying to everybody, oh, looking after dogs, looking after animals. It's so important. It was a 32 kilogram golden retriever living in a tiny flat with us in Sweden that she never fucking walked. Never. So she would be yapping all this about animal rights and looking after animals and looking after your dog properly. The only person who walked her fucking dog in three years was me. 
She and I would say to her sometimes, like I'd be like, you have to walk your dog. So she'd put him on a lead and take him out for 20 minutes on lead and bring him back. And I'd be like, that's a 32 kilogram animal. He needs off lead for an hour and a half. Do it again. No, not doing it. Not doing it. It's unnecessary. He's just an animal. He's fine. Like, he's just an go and go and post on Facebook about how you feel about animal rights again. The same girl, uh, she sent this dog. I hope you're enjoying the podcast. Here's a word from our sponsor, Rocket Money. Many of our viewers have saved thousands using Rocket Money to save the money off subscriptions they didn't even know about. Rocket Money cancels subscriptions for people that are tricky and time consuming. Rocket Money also alerts you to subscriptions that can save you money. Try it free for 30 days, just enough time to try it, and then completely forget about it. In fact, over 80% of people have subscriptions they forgot about. You could be wasting money and not even realizing it. Rocket Money helps you find those forgotten subscriptions so you can stop paying for ones you don't use. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Stop throwing your money away, cancel unwanted subscriptions, and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. That's rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, rocketmoney.com slash Sean. Thank you for supporting our sponsor, Rocket Money. Enjoy the podcast. We would been in a country, let's say Italy, and she wanted him from Italy back in the UK. I said, I'll go and drive and pick him up. And uh, no, she hired somebody to do it. He went in a, in a, a van with 10 other dogs and I did not want this to happen, but it was her choice. When he arrived and was dropped off with me, he drank water from a bowl. And I think he drank like three bowls in one go. I was like, he's totally dehydrated, clearly terrified, clearly traumatized. He's, he's a big, fl- you, you know what retrievers are like? They're big floppy Huge. sensitive yeah, my brother things. Has one. They're daft, yeah. but they can be funny about their nails on metal. And I think he'd been kept on a metal floor. So he didn't even want to walk. He was trying to do this with his, I was heartbroken. The reason I'm telling you this is because public facing, this is the girl who'd be like animal rights all day. She'd lecture people. She'd stop people walking their dogs and tell them how to do it. And I'd be stood there going, are you fucking joking? Try looking after your own dog. Physically, he looked good. She'd groom him. She'd make his teeth clean. So everything that was public facing, that was dealt with. But actually giving him a good quality of life, she didn't give a shit. She didn't give a shit. That's what some parents do with their children now. 100%. Yeah, dream them up, make them look the part, but don't actually look after them. Yes. Internally. This is this is like classic pro-social narcissism. So they want to be seen in a certain way publicly, but behind closed doors, they they don't care. I've never heard of pro-social narcissism. Meghan Markle, and That's we're going to get to, to that. Say, yeah. So, Richard, in the early days, as it's getting worse and worse, <laughs> do you <laughs> feel in a past life? Were you the guy on the gibbet that disemboweled people and then cut them open? <laughs> Now remove his genitals. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, like a long protracted story yeah. on this show. Um, were you too ashamed to tell your family and friends? Oh, God. Did you feel shame. trapped? Oh, that's where I went to with the dog. So I, you asked me what happened in month four. I'd be walking the dog in Sweden on this hard uh, Swedish frozen muddy ground. And I'd just be crying. I couldn't tell anyone. I was so ashamed. All my mates were like, Oh, she's gorgeous. You've landed on your feet there, lads. You're punching above your weight there. Family's made up because she's sweet. She's got like this high-pitched voice and she's so feminine and she loves animals. All my family have got their dogs and they're into the environments and all that as well. They're all into, you know, they're, they're, they're from the world. It's it's a it's a thing there. Um, they loved her. Everybody loved her. And I was behind closed doors going, she's an absolute bastard to me. But I was also thinking, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm doing this which was the worst element of it um, was I started blaming myself and assigning responsibility to myself for my own abuse, which we know happens. We know happens with kidnapped victims. It happens with child abuse victims, victims of sexual assault. Because the abuse is so bad, it breaks down the ego boundaries to a level of infantilism where you don't have any boundaries as you wouldn't have done as a kid. Um, it's a bit, it's not very nice saying this, but I'll go through it quickly to help people understand. If you're in a household where there's domestic violence and you're three years old and you see daddy hit mummy and you see, you see daddy in a rage and mummy cries, as a three-year-old, you're not thinking, I'm me, 
that's my mum and that's my dad because you can't, you're boundaryless. You're you crying, pissing your pants, scared. You're your dad, you're your mum and you're the house in which it happens, I claim. This is my, this is Richard's personal claim because it's boundaryless. So we become the environment itself and it's all us. So there is no sense of like, well, I couldn't be possibly responsible because my father's an alcoholic and this is how his father, you don't think that when you're a kid, it's just distressing trauma. It's happening to me. And because it's happening to me, it is me. So automatically you assign blame to yourself. I did this. Even though you've got no agency, you didn't consent to it, you couldn't consent to it, you still end up blaming yourself. So as an adult, you wouldn't do that. And if it was a quick assault on the street, you won't. But if I take you to an environment where I control it, instead of having PTSD, which is a quick assault on the street, you blame the person, you say whatever, like if I control what you eat and when you sleep for a week, two weeks, it's no longer PTSD, it's now complex PTSD. Your ego boundaries break and you'll blame yourself. Even though, you, even though rationally you know it's me, you'll still blame yourself. Why do you think I cook your dinner every night? <laughs> <laughs> we, we do have some therapeutic work to do. <laughs> All right, so the narcissist has got a grip. Yeah. What happens in the second year? Um, I, oh, it's so embarrassing. Um, I start to learn to live with this and I develop a skill... Um, of keeping her happy. I get good at it over time. I do things that I really, really don't want to do. I say things that I really don't believe and really don't want to say. Like what? Oh, fucking hell. <laughs> um, like what? Basically, anything that she said is how things work. If you went against it because you don't happen to believe that that is true, um, like I said, it could be a two day silent treatment. It could be a screaming rage. It could be God knows what. Um, she, I've heard this, uh, from the difference between female and male narcissists. A lot of my female clients will say male narcissists withdraw sex. She never, ever withdrew sex from me. And I've never had a female narcissist. I've been with three withdraw sex. I don't know why there is this gendered difference. Men seem to punish women by withdrawing sex, but women, as far as I know, got no proper research, don't do that. And I think in a way, looking back, it was a way to keep me in a sort of a hypnotized, blissed out state. Because if that had happened, I probably would have had the sense to sober up. Keep love bombing now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Keep me, in fact, it's a kind of trauma bonding because I was enjoying sex with somebody who was abusive and that's traumatic. It was humiliating. One of the questions I have got is, can people, obviously narcissists struggle to, to fall in love. Mm. Can a narcissist make love? Um, in the sense that you mean no. 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 But they like can emotional? No. 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 And um, that's one of the, there would be a way of knowing whether you're dealing with a narcissist or not. I mean, making love, loving somebody requires intimacy, requires honesty and requires vulnerability. I mean, it's just outside of a narcissist capabilities. There's no way, but they could fake it to somebody who was impressionable. They're not good fraudsters. They're not good con artists. We all have to stop telling ourselves this. They're actually quite bad at it, but we want it to be true. So it's that's our part in it. We really want it to be true. So when they're doing a really bad job of convincing us that they're making love, We'll be like, wow, this is amazing. It's clearly not happening. And that, but you, because you're lonely, because you're traumatized, because of unresolved issues that should be dealt with in therapy, you just want to believe that it's happening when it isn't. Did you believe this girl in question was? No. No. So you knew it was. She was a robot. She was a sex robot. It was, it was humiliating. I knew perfectly well. I was teaching narcissistic abuse recovery at the time. I was teaching people how to protect themselves in this. I knew every single time that we had sex. She she was hypersexual. She liked sex. She was enjoying it and she was having an orgasm in her weird psychopathic way because I don't know how much I could say on your podcast. She she had um fantasies that were were non-consensual and I knew that and so she was getting what she wanted from me and then I was getting what I wanted from her. It was so humiliating because I kept letting her do that letting her do that. Like I was an active participant in it, but then I, afterwards I'd hate myself. And not for one second did I think, oh, she means this or she loves me or I knew she didn't. 
I knew she didn't, but I couldn't, I couldn't leave because of the social consequences of leaving. And I felt like this is as good as it's ever going to get for me. So it's her or no one. And you couldn't speak to anyone about it? I couldn't. Now, haha. So you wanted to know what happened in year two. Yes. At the end of year two, this is a common thing that narcissists do. Her own narcissism caught up with her. Narcissists will tell you, it's it's called uh, gaslighting. People have started misusing the term gaslighting, then they think it means lying. Gaslighting is not lying. Lying is a part of gaslighting. Gaslighting is a specific tool of emotional manipulation to make the target feel like they're losing their minds. So they will lie to you in a way that makes you feel like you're losing your grasp of reality. There's tons of gaslighting tactics, but one of them is to tell you you're crazy. You're crazy, you're crazy, you're crazy, you need therapy. And one day she went into a psychotic episode and she said, you're so crazy that by Monday, you must have booked with a therapist and I want to see the booking form. So I went, okay, because it was all my fault. Everything that happened was all my fault. We were living in, we'd moved to uh, Dublin at the time. There was not enough grasshoppers in Italy. So I moved, <laughs> of, course. To, uh, the, of course, so I moved my darling to Dublin, which is extremely fucking expensive for rents. Malahide, especially if you have a fucking dog. <laughs> so, so I went uh, 4,000 pounds, 4,000 euros a month it was. So, so she said, you have to have a therapist and you must go to therapy because you're, uh, a sex addict and you're a psychopath and you're just like your father and, and so on and so forth. My father always said, he went to prison. Um, this was a bit of a trigger for me. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe maybe you're right, darling. Maybe I am a piece of shit. Let, <laughs> let me do what it takes to make myself better. <laughs> so I went to uh, the therapist in Malahide and um, I can't remember his name now, but if people, you just email me and I'll dig, I'll dig his name out. He's great. Um, and it was the best thing she could have done was telling me I was crazy and sent me to that therapist. You got someone to talk to finally. Finally, yeah. And he was laughing. Laughed his fucking head off. He's like, oh, so you're the narcissist historia. Okay, <laughs> that's great. And he just he just pissed himself through the entire counselling <laughs> session. I was like, could you stop? I'm paying you for this. And he was like, I know you from YouTube. How do you not know what's going on? And I went, fucking <laughs> The shame and the humiliation. And I said to him, this is, this is so humiliating. He said, oh, don't worry, I'm Catholic. And so we went through this whole process and uh, he said, there's no way you can't know this isn't, this isn't narcissism. I said, no, I think this is PTSD and trauma. So he said, okay, here are the nine traits of narcissism. If this skull is, tick is, is she ticking all nine of them? I was like, 100% yes. So he said, okay, if she doesn't have narcissism, then that means narcissism doesn't exist. Would you agree? And I went, oh shit. Can you remember the nine? Yeah, I wanted to know. The nine traits of narcissism. Yeah. Oh, you're yeah. testing me now. Grandiosity, a strong sense of entitlement, um, extreme jealousy. We should probably look it up. So there's grandiosity, you're, delusion you're delusionally entitled, envy, you're very attached to a false sense of yourself. Um, I think you have to be prone to narcissistic injury and narcissistic rage. Um, I can't remember. We'd have, we'd have to look them up. But we went we went through the nine. Has she cheated on you? Um, uh, oh, God. I, I can't prove it. I can't prove it. Um, she definitely emotionally cheated on me. Messaging um, someone else. Messaging other people. She went away to do grasshopper research and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, she'd uh, somehow acquired the 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 contact details of a of an air steward. Um, yes, uh, I, I can't prove it. What I never asked before the relationship, um, because I just wouldn't ask that, was anything about a sexual history. But as I went across time and I analysed what had happened, I was like, oh, this was a highly sexually promiscuous goal. No moral judgment, do whatever you like. But in her case, it was a manifestation of uh, mental health issues. There is something called a sexual narcissist. And I believe that's, that's what she is. So if she didn't, it's only because she didn't have the opportunity to whilst we were living together. Um, I think as soon as she had the opportunity, she, she would have done. How did you detect the messaging to these people? Oh, I think you just know when, like, the phone usage and people like suddenly are doing this, taking it to the, the bathroom, phone, taking it to the bathroom, yeah. doing doing this kind of of 
Strange stuff with the phone. Really, really strange stuff with the phone. Strange stuff with laptops. She was constantly accusing me of cheating. Did you confront oh, her about- that's a classic sign, isn't classic it? Classic sign. She was obsessed with that. Did you confront her about the messages? I did. I did once, and I think I think we actually split up for for uh, a couple of months over over one of the the messages. Um, did you think it was over at that point? Did I? Uh, kind of. I mean, I was dating other girls, and I did think we'd split up, and then she she started. <laughs> So embarrassing. Sending you pictures. <laughs> oh no, that, that I could live with. Lingerie shot. Yeah, she's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's how she Read drew me in. back in. Um, she she messaged me on some app. It was either Facebook or WhatsApp. Uh, one night, and we went from twelve o'clock at night till five o'clock in the morning, and she admitted everything she'd done wrong. And she said, "I have narcissistic personality disorder. I'm really sorry." I've I've studied this. I've watched your videos. You're right. I was wrong. I apologize. I'm going to go to therapy, and I just need to see you. So I went to go and see so her. So she came to that conclusion herself. It wasn't. She went to a therapist and someone told her. No, she wasn't watched she your videos course in the first place because of an interest in narcissism. Wasn't the what? Sorry, wasn't she at your course yes. in the first place because she was a narcissist? Yes, interested because, in narcissism. because her ex boyfriend was a narcissistic psychopath. She said. Okay, but really, that might have been a couple story. I don't, I think actually based on some of the stuff I saw of him and some of the emails he sent her, he probably was, but it's perfectly common for narcissistic psychopaths to get together with other narcissistic psychopaths. And then who blames who though? They take turns uh, eating each other's flesh. <laughs> it's actually it's actually a more stable uh, relationship format and has more longevity than narcissist and a codependent. That's why we work. <laughs> Give me your flesh. Now you know. Now you know. So, so all this confession that she went through, I can't remember which messaging or what social media she used it, but she got me to go and see her where she was in the country that she was at the time. We had sex a few times and she went and deleted it all. And I said, um, after we, it was, it was idyllic, you know, we got back together. I love you. I'm so glad that you've got the humility and the empathy to do this and to see that it was, it wasn't just me, it was you. And she deleted all the messages. And then on the third day I was with her, she was like, what are you talking about? I said, you you told me you were gonna to go to therapy. I'm not going to therapy. You told, you told me you had narcissistic personality disorder. No, I didn't. And I was like, this is the day, this is the time. It was, tw it was midnight, it was one o'clock in the morning. We spoke until five o'clock in the morning. I think you must've been drunk. So she deleted them off her phone, but not yours. She did. They were gone. So I don't know what messaging app she used, oh. but one maybe Snapchat's great at that. Telegram or Signal. You can delete. You can delete all. You can delete the whole chat. And she deleted the whole chat. But we'd already had sex. You should have screenshots. Well, I was a younger man. <laughs> and now I screenshot fucking, I keep receipts of fucking everything. Because uh, even on WhatsApp, people can go back and delete stuff. But yeah, she she denied it. She said, I'm not going to therapy. I don't need therapy. I do not know what you're talking about. And I was like, you have a problem. She said she'd been to a therapist in the European country she was in. And the therapist told her categorically there was no chance that she had narcissistic personality disorder. I said, what test did he do? No test. How did he come to that conclusion? We spoke 45 minutes. I was like, okay. Did, did she ever broach the subject of engagement, marriage, and life oh, yeah. insurance? Yes, she did. She broached Asking it. Asking for a friend, are you? Broached it many, <laughs> many times. I think in the last five months that we were together, once I went to therapy in Dublin with your man there, who sorted me out, she could feel me genuinely breaking away from the relationship, not... Um, the sort of like, I'm not putting up with this anymore, but I'm totally going to put up with this kind of a thing. I genuinely was much calmer and was like, okay, I need to grieve because I'm just sad. I'm not angry. I'm like, this is, this sucks. She got scared. And at that point she started to demand that I have kids with her. At one point she started going into the psychotic, much more open rages again. And I recorded her a couple of times. Um, you, uh, you have to give me children. I'm turning 30. If you don't get me pregnant within five months, then we're done. And I was like, why not just be done now? I don't love you and I don't want to be with you. Why don't we just break up now instead? And she's like, don't you fucking say that to me. You give me children. <laughs> I was like, I've never been more aroused, my love. 
<laughs> please let me put a baby in you so yeah yeah she did she was demanding that in the end yeah so when the doctor the therapist in ireland said these things to you and you withdrew mm. obviously what he said wasn't strong enough for you to just sever the cord oh well i mean i had done two and a half years of utter insanity with her and i don't think i did more see we would do one a week maybe i did six weeks with him uh then she insisted on us going to a couple's counselor so so the irish guy i did six weeks one-on-one -on -one with him then we went to a couple's counselor who's, an, who's a south african guy and he clocked her straight away he was great straight away he clocked her and um so we did our session and i called him the next day and uh he was like you know what you have to do so he clocked her, but he didn't say anything to her at the time. No, he didn't. He didn't. Fucking oh god, that's for that. strong flashback there. What do you think he saw right well, away? He just knew. He knew what he was looking at. I saw it on his face. He knew what he was looking at, and I called him, and he said, "He said I can't tell you anything that you don't already know." And he said, "Fuck." He said, "You know what you have to do, and you have to do it today. Do it now. When she comes home, do it now." How that make you feel? Fucking terrified terrified i can feel it now i was like fuck you know i will remember for the rest of my life sitting in that living room i'm a grown man grown man like you know you know my background was self-defense i had a world recognized brand and teaching fucking high level military how to kill people and all that embarrassing so shameful i sat there in shock and the dog was there and the dog's looking at me because he can feel the tension in the air he's like what's going on here mate so i was like just don't cover the ears lads you don't want to listen to this she came in and I, I I I gave it to her. I was like, "This is this is what it is." What did you say? Yeah. She said, "I'll never ever forgive you for this. I'll never ever forgive you for this." Were you cohabiting at this time? We were. I moved out and went to a hotel, even though I was paying for the apartment. Oh, Got, well, let's go back to the conversation. Right. With so her. she walks yeah. in. So she she walks in, and I'm like. Listen here, darling. <coughs> you sit down. I have a few words to say to you. <laughs> um, and uh, it was it was weird because we were sat at a table where like a week before uh, she'd had one of her psychotic rages and she picked a glass up. I've been glassed. I was glassed when I was uh, 21. I've, got, I've, still got, I've still got glass in my eye. Um, so I had somebody, I was, I was gay bashed. I'm not gay, but I was in a gay bar. Some guy went in there to gay bash somebody. He smashed a half pint glass against the side of my eye. And then it shattered and went into my gums, went into my lip, went into the bag under my eye. It's a little bit still come out now. Um, she knew that. And she jumped up and she picked up a champagne flute and stood over me with it. And I was like, ah, oh, shit. So we're at the same, she didn't do anything. She put it down and she, she calmed down. We're at that same table, like, five or six days later the reason why she flew into that rage and picked up the glass is because i'd been to therapy and because i was getting better and she wanted to know what the therapist was saying to me and i'm like i'm not telling you because you went to the therapist that she told you to go to yes. you're now in yes. trouble yes. of course yes yes and because i was getting better uh she would tell me what he said i was like i don't have to tell you anything and i was calm she'd not seen that before uh what did he tell there again so embarrassing you know what my therapist taught me that really helped the narcissism expert and self-defense expert he said why don't you start trying to say no that's it so i would just be there with her i'd be like no <laughs> no and, and she'd be like what the fuck is this and i just did it again and again and again and she'd be like you have done this because blah 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 and i'd be like no that's not true and she just didn't know. How, I don't know what I was doing before. I think I was trying to argue the case. I think I'd be like, no, it's not like that. I'm really like this. And I just started saying to her, nah, it's not. No, no, no. She couldn't handle it. And so the rage got worse. So to answer your question, a week later, I'm sat at the same table. She comes in. She knows. Because I'm sat at the table like this. Who sits at the table in the living room, you know, like that? Come and sit down with me, darling. She knew what she was getting before she sat down. Um, and I just said to her, like, okay, I've been to therapy. We've been to a couple's therapist. I've had plenty of time to think about this. And um, there is no future in this for me and you together. We should stop now. I moved out that night and went to a hotel. Hold on. What was her response? Oh, the, res the, the response was, yeah, fuck you. She was furious, furious. She was like, fuck you. I can't believe you've done this to me. I'm never, ever going to forgive you for this. You are the piece of shit that I always knew you were. You're just like your father. Boom, boom, boom. As many, as many um, triggers as she could. 
But the South African guy had already told me she was going to do that. She was so you knew the punches were coming. Oh, it was coming. It was Cause coming. Because they, they try and destroy you, don't they, yes. when they get to this point? Yeah. They want to leave you wrecked. They want to leave you wrecked. Um, and he'd warned me. And he said something like, he said, I can't remember. He's like, you, you, just, you just have to face it. You just have to do it. Fuck. <laughs> it was bad. Fuck, it was bad. But, did it and uh, went to a hotel that night. And I was like, I'm paying four grand a month on that place. Why am I in the hotel? And I sent her a text. I was like, because I'd said originally, like, you've got a week to leave and I'll go and stay in a hotel for a week. And then I sent her a text that night. I was like, that apartment and that contract is mine. You fucking leave. You go and stay in a hotel. Um, and by that point, she'd stopped arguing with me and she was like, yeah, fine. Uh, she moved out three days later and, and that was it. But it was hard. It was just saying to her, this is over. It was fucking brutal. It was really, really hard. Did, were you at the point of changing your mind in the seconds before you did it? Uh, was it hard to maintain resolve? Not, no, I was only, a, I was only, I was just scared. I, I didn't, I think the therapist uh, in Malahide uh, is a good guy and he'd already made me see that like the relationship had probably been over for a long time and I'd already grieved it really like when I was in Sweden and I was uh, in the beginning and I was like I was crying pretty much every day it's because I knew it was all fake I knew it was nonsense so there was no no the resolve the resolve was there it was just doing it it was just tearing the plaster off and it was it was fucking frightening was your heart going and everything mate well, you know Liverpool. You know some of the characters I've worked for and dealt with. I've worked for Stephen French. Uh, I worked for uh, for for Sean there. What used to work for Capital. Like I've had call outs, proper call outs, and felt I felt like a buzz, like a bit scared. This was ten times fucking worse. I've had coked up cage fighters and not shook. Not but with her, I was like. <sighs> Fucking hell, okay. Here we go. Come come here and sit down. I need to have a word with you. It was insane. Totally insane. I was, I don't even know what I was scared of. She's a tiny little thing. It's only like 45 kilograms. She's five foot six. Is it the emotional investment that causes that? Because in a bar, for example, someone comes in, threatens you, you don't even know the person. Is it all those years you spent together? Is it, it builds that, the, the, the force is there, isn't it, of the, of the bond? The force is there, the bond is the investment. There's nothing a fella's gonna do to me that is like, like, we, what's he gonna do? Were you no longer in love with her at that point? I, no, I wasn't. I wasn't. I'd probably not. She treated me so badly. I probably had not been in love with her for for, for about two years. So after the first year, you were no longer in love I wasn't with her. In love with her? No, no. She was. She was. God bless her. But I you're hope trapped because of these other psychodynamics. I was trapped. I, I, I really, really hope that she's been to therapy. I know that she's like she's she's moved on. She's she's got kids. I hope she's been to therapy. I hope she has a good life. But and I hope she never does to anybody else what she did to me. She tore me to shreds. So you fell out of love with her for two years. Did you think you could somewhat fix her? Oh yeah, yeah. I thought I could fix her. I thought I could fix it. I thought that was as good as it would ever get for me. I didn't think I could live without her. Um, and I think like, you know, you say, what's the fear? Like versus like getting into a fight because I could get my head stamped on and die. But that's almost like a known outcome. With her, it was unknown outcomes. And it was, it really relates to childhood trauma. It really relates to stuff with my mom and with my dad and, and love, self-love. And really the fear that like I would disintegrate, which... I nearly did in the aftermath. I mean, it was, I nearly did disintegrate. I nearly did fall apart. What about the me. fear of her reaction? Did she go quietly or did she do what narcissists do and try and destroy? Oh God, no. She spent a year. I mean, my, my mum stopped talking to me because of the stuff she was telling people. What, so was, what she was saying? What was the first thing that happened then that, in her campaign against you? Oh God. She went to... She went to friends of... She went to her family. Uh, she went to friends of my family. And um, yeah, she, she, she told them that I'd like physically abused her. Oh no. Um, she, 
yeah, she she basically said I was violent. Who's not going to believe her? I'm fucking 100 kilograms with a shaved head and she's a tiny little thing. I look like, at the time, I look like a thug. I've got a background in martial arts and nightclub security. Of course. Of and that's course why these me. allegations are so powerful and, and they're weaponized so often mm. is because if you say that, people are, some of them are going to be, there's no smoke without fire. Maybe yeah. you did do it. Yeah. And, you know, they weren't there, so there's no proof. So how did you, did these people start to contact you then and say, what's up? Uh, yeah. Um, I was I was attacked uh, for it, but not by family, but by friends of, of family, people I'd known since I was eight years old. Didn't that show who your true friends were, though? Oh, 100%. So it actually benefited you in, in, in the, the long term. Yeah. Those people who I wouldn't, I would, you know, I don't wish them any harm, but I would never, ever speak. You've known me since I was eight. You wouldn't even sit down with me and just ask me and look into my eyes and maybe, because maybe I did, you know, maybe, um, who knows what happens between a man and a woman behind closed doors. I always say that of any, or, or, or a woman and a woman, a man and a man behind closed doors. We don't know. Like people are shadow activated. It's intimacy. It's relationships are fucking hard. It's the hardest thing you'll do. Maybe somebody will put hands on somebody else drunk or a moment or a trigger or something. She was claiming it was systematic and that it went on for two and a half years and that she was terrified of me. And they just, they, some of these people just said, yeah, fine, we'll have that. How did you, that make you feel when these people who have been friends? Suicidal, yours, suicidal. Did it? Yeah, yeah. And they, 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 these, it's complicated. I was, oh, I don't know whether I should say this publicly. I was raised with their son. He became, he was a naughty boy. Uh, he, he became a drug dealer and sadly in the last month of me being with this girl, he, he, he was taking coke and then he was coming down with, with, with heroin and you know how that goes. He was one of those stories, he took China white and didn't wake up. 18 months later, these people, I think, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what grief does to people. They sided with her basically and, and they attacked me. So they were projecting, but do you also think there's uh, people out there who get off on just jumping on things to, to kind of cause trouble? 100%. And, what's it called? Sh Schadenfreude, isn't it? Sh uh, Sch Schadenfreude. Yeah. yeah. Um, the taking pleasure in other people's suffering. If you feel powerless, you can join a mob and you can attack somebody. You might even not be invested in who it is, but it feels good to hate. It feels good to attack if you yourself are full of hate and you're powerless. Um and, it, you know, I was somebody. I was, I had something. I'd made something in my life. I was an entrepreneur. It's, and these are people who'd had like failed businesses and it, there was a lot. It's, it's complicated. It's a very complicated story. My uh, family, ultimately, when I learned, I went back to more therapy and I learned to communicate better with them and to be more vulnerable with them, they understood. Did you go from feeling you had to explain yourself to realizing these people were never going to listen to you and just writing them off and then moving on? With with the people in question, there was two incidents that were extremely painful um, and, and they really, really betrayed me very, very badly, very violently. And no, I didn't explain myself to them. In fact, I went the other way. Uh, at one point, I went into uh, learned helplessness into an interaction. And they were like, uh, why were you hitting her? I said, I just couldn't control my emotions. That's, it, that's who I am. Because I thought, fuck it. Just fuck it. Yeah, fine. You, were that, you got yeah, that low in, your, in, your, in your own mind. I'd gone. I went to them looking for support. I went to them for help. And I didn't understand what I was walking into, into that interaction. I walked into a setup with like hands down. And um, they, they went for me. They really, really went for me. And I was just like, yeah, you're right. I am a piece of shit. It's like animalistic, isn't it? They see you're at a low and they prey on that. They yep. see you're vulnerable and they prey on that and exploit it. Yep. Yep. And there's, there's, there's narcissistic psychopathy in that story as well. There's reasons why they did that, but I didn't see it because I still saw them through the eyes of an eight year old kid. And they, like, they were like second parents to me. Um, there, there was a, there's me and my sister and there's the, there's the boy and the girl from that family. We, we grew up together. And then I realized that day I was like, oh shit, these people who should, who should love me, they, they want me dead. Not metaphorically, they would have been more comfortable if I was in the ground with their son because it would prove 
There was nothing wrong with the way they parented their son. There was nothing wrong with them as people. Uh, we were both just shitty kids. We were just shit kids. There's nothing to be done. You said your mum had to cut her off. Had she been interacting with your mum to, uh, to burn you? Yeah, well, like, yes, the the, the, the ex-girlfriend, she was interacting with my mum. Me and my mum had a falling out. We didn't speak for a year. Was it the same stuff? Yeah. She, yeah, yeah. Was yeah. it the same stuff she was telling your mum? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And your mum believed her, did she, in the beginning? My, 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 yeah, well, my father's, my father is a really, really, really bad man. And uh, he'd done, he'd done horrible stuff. And like, we all have this suspicion, don't we? Like the, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You've got the same, same DNA. If your dad's like that, well, maybe you are a little bit, like, you seem like a nice guy, but maybe behind closed doors, you are, you are a bit of a bully or, or whatever. I mean, it's, it, I swore at her, I shouted at her. And it's like, I'm too big. What would I do with a 45 kilogram goal? It was not going to be really damaging. Like I couldn't put hands on her if I wanted to. Where would it, where, what am I going to do in, in rage, in an actual rage that isn't going to land me in prison? There was just no way I touched her in that way. I can understand where, you, where your mom's coming from, you know, but that's got to be the most serious repercussion of this woman's uh, lies for you is your mum because your relationship with your mum is special, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's, it should be sacred, and it, and it is sacred. We have a we have a great relationship now. There was other stuff before that had made it rocky. Like I'd been in trouble, um, criminal trouble, because of the lifestyle. You you know what I'm talking. About. You know what yeah, the lifestyle yeah. looks like. Uh, it's very hard to stay clean. Um, when you were interacting with people like that, they see you, you're, you're young, you're bright, you've got potential and you get pulled into stuff. And, and you know, I, I let a lot of people down. I ruined a lot of opportunities over the years and I had behaved really, really badly, but not like that, not like that. Yes, I was violent, but not to, not to women, not to women. I was like, so it was bad it was bad and and we resolved it and then yes when you say we resolved it you and your mum me and my mum did and then the woman and the man in question who were the family friends they tried it on again with my mum and my stepfather and they cut them off oh god they cut them off they they just said no good. we're not having that good. because they know me better now they know me better now they didn't they didn't have a chance to know me i wasn't i wasn't around them very much and i was doing Crazy things with crazy people. I can't, can't, I, I didn't, we have to take responsibility for the way other people perceive us. And when I look back, I'm like, okay, that's not good. Like the way I was living and who I was associated with was not good. And at your lowest point, you felt suicidal. Mm. How did you start to rebuild yourself after that? Uh, my God, I think the first thing I did was wrote poetry. Mm. And uh, it actually, uh, after the incident, it actually really, really helped. Uh, went to therapy. Um, and just took the time I needed. I needed time to process it. It was, it was brutal. Like it was, uh, my whole perception of reality shifted. I started to go back into uh, religion, spirituality, philosophy. I was like, okay, the world doesn't work the way that I thought because I got, I got, I got really badly betrayed by parental figures who were people who've been in my life, my whole life, who I loved. Um, uh, and this girl who I thought was the love of my life, she'd betrayed me as well. And so I just had to be like, okay, like my sense of evil was more to do with, with men and crime, psychopathic men doing, that's evil. And then I was like, oh, there's a different kind of evil that can come inside of family units that can come through girlfriends, boyfriends, husband, wives, that's coming through the avenue of love. And I don't think it's very often depicted. It's not in a lot of movies. It's not in a lot of books. It is out there, but it's quite rare. Um, somebody would use love as a vector and as a tool to leverage you and to exploit you. I mean, it's it's crazy. It's uh, the movie Green Mile. That's why John Coffey chooses to die because he lives in a world where that can happen. That it's lost a little bit in the, in the movie, but that's the way Stephen King wrote it. And it is there in the movie. Um, he has a chance to escape and he says, no, I'd rather die than live in this world. And that was the reason he gave because love is leverage to kill people. So she's burning you. She goes after your family and friends mm. with these lies. Mm. What else did she do? Um, 
I think uh, it, she tried a few things professionally, like with with my followers. Um, so she put stuff online. I think so. I think so. But um, the followers that I have, there are there is a section of people who absolutely hate me, who totally hate me. But they're not the thick end of the wedge. The thick end of the wedge are my followers. In order to follow me and to put up with my cantankerous, misanthropic nature, you need to be fairly mentally resistant and you need to be an independent thinker anyway. And a lot of the stuff was just like this. It's, it's obviously bollocks and it's obvious where it's coming from. Um, and so I, 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 I was gratified by that. I actually got a lot of support and I didn't fight it. I didn't address it at all. And it basically died. Did she try and have sex with any of your mates? Uh, no, what she did was something that we joked about in the relationship. And I, oh. so I'd said about a couple of friends that I knew um, that they'd split up with their girlfriends and the girlfriend, in order to take revenge on them, this had happened in the world a few times. I was like, this is such a scout thing to do. So the girl immediately gets with another guy and has a baby with him to be like, ha ha, to the ex. And I was like, said to her, could you imagine being a baby that was born just so that your mom could say fuck off to her ex-boyfriend? How wretched that would be. And how many babies do we have around the world in Liverpool that are born like that as a joke? And she would laugh at that joke. And she went and did the same thing. She found the first guy she could in uh, the town that she lived in, like two, two, two roads down, a local rugby coach. And she was pregnant with him within uh, nine months of a, uh, uh, nine months of a splitting up, she'd gotten pregnant. And I got asked, did that actually burn you? No, it was the wrong thing to do to me. It's uh, that, that was something that would hurt her. This is the stu this is the latent stupidity of narcissism. The projection, they project too much. She did the worst thing for her, not the worst thing for me. I, I just said, good luck, you know, Alhamdulillah, go ahead. Because you know, that helps you, doesn't it? Because the first thing she did to help you say go to the first, the second thing she did was have the kid. Yeah. Because having the kid then is going to take the focus off burning you, isn't it? As far as I'm concerned, like once you are a mother, once you are a mother, that that's I'm not I'm not pursuing you. I'm not I'm not. You're now that little. And I'd, I'd, my mum showed me a picture of her. She put it on page, but you're now that little girl's mum. That's your role. You as a, as my ex girlfriend is gone. That's and, and, and did she stop burning you at that she point? She stopped. She stopped. She had a she had a child to raise. And that was why, because of the baby. I think so. I think so. I, that's why I think everybody deserves a second chance. Everybody deserves. You don't know, like with with psychology, we assume it's all mental. We assume it's all like um, it's all childhood trauma, and a lot of it is, and a lot of it is mental. But some of these conditions, like the psychotic rages she was going through. We don't understand hormones very well yet. We don't understand the brain very well. We haven't mapped the brain very well. Endocrinology is still like a baby subject. Maybe people, maybe she, maybe, maybe this might sound sexist. Maybe she was a human being with a genetic predisposition to have children and she needed children. And once she had children, whatever that thing, oh, that, just, that just went. I don't know. I do you know. credit her with forcing you to accelerate your growth mentally and spiritually? That would be codependent. I credit myself. <laughs> <laughs> All praise to God. <laughs> <laughs> but, if, but if this had never happened, yeah. you would have not have been forced to have learned and matured the way you have. Yes, that's 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 true. I credit I credit the the situation and the experience. And I, I this is part of the when I went back looking at spirituality and my own spiritual beliefs, I was like, oh look. This is like Buddhism. Uh, all of life is suffering. The observation of suffering is what causes enlightenment. And then through that, we follow a discipline, which is which is all religion is like that. You go, wow, fuck, existence sucks. This hurts. Is there a God? Does anything matter? Okay, then we start to form like an ideology, uh, reverse engineered to the, to the prime principle, which is suffering. Because if everything's fine, why would you bother your ass with all that praying and meditation and nonsense? It has to suck. It has to hurt. So yeah, the situation helped me to grow for sure. So do you know a screening pr place in process um, if you meet someone yeah. that you are automatically avoiding what happened to you because you see the red flags yeah. now? If she's got like a pretty face and like big boobs. <laughs> <laughs> There's my car keys. Here's a bank card. Go and do what you want. That's my screening process because I'm very stupid. <laughs> Hope you're enjoying the podcast. Here's a word from our sponsor, Manscaped. Cannonballs, 
This summer, it's not about the size of those cannonballs. Thank God, as I can barely see them. <laughs> well, they were big enough to do the job, weren't they, Jen? <laughs> we kicked. It's about making a splash with our friends at Manscaped. Prep for barbecue season by making sure your grill master has the hottest dog seen this summer. When you're at the cookout, let the meat speak for itself with Manscaped's Performance Package 4.0. It's time to get ready and not sweaty. The Manscaped Performance Package 4.0 has everything you need to guarantee you'll have the most mouth-watering treat at the party. They have built the ultimate bundle for your summer grooming. So, get 20% off and free shipping with the code SEAN20, S-H-A-U-N-20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code SEAN20. Manscaped, the perfect way to get your patties sizzling hot this summer. Thanks for supporting our sponsor. Back to the podcast. I've just pulled up on my iPad. Um, we were talking about the nine symptoms of narcissistic personality disorder, mm-hmm. and the acronym actually spells "special me" here. So special me, okay. Special me. So S for sense of self-importance. Uh, P for preoccupation with power, beauty, or success. Um, e for entitled. C for can only be around people who are important or special. Yeah. Um, I interpersonality. Um, for their own gain, oh, oh, sorry, exploitation for their own gain. A for arrogant, mm. L for a lack of empathy, oh, yeah. M must be admired, or E envious of others or believe that others are envious of them. Mm. Mm. That's good. I've that's got about a five good spe- of them. special me. That's that's a good acronym for it. Yeah. So if someone comes to you and they say, I'm in a relationship, suspected narcissist. Mm. What would you say? What was the first thing you would say to them? I would say, what do you understand narcissism to be? Because it doesn't mean my boyfriend's an ass. It doesn't mean my girlfriend has forgot my birthday present. Narcissism is, or saying he's a narcissist or she's a narcissist. It's it's too commonly used. I, and I want to know whether people mean, do you mean this person has narcissistic personality disorder? Or are you saying they're a bit selfish? Because there is a world of difference between the two. Somebody who's a bit selfish, even if they're like really arrogant, really interpersonally exploitative, really envious, I can have a chat with them. You know, they could go to therapy. We could fix that. We could sort it out uh, or at least improve it. Narcissistic personality disorder. You ain't doing anything with that. It's rigid. They've had that since childhood. There's no authentic person there to assist. They live in a fantasy world. You won't, you won't penetrate them. So we've had Samantha Markle on the channel three times, Megan's sister, mm. and she is quite well versed in psychotherapy and psychiatry. Mm-hmm. She's got a background in it, and she has classified Megan Markle as a malignant narcissist. What mm-hmm. does that mean? There are different types. There's like prosocial, there's sexual, there's cerebral, but malignant narcissist means, I mean, you are, you may as well say a narcissistic psychopath. There's the anti- Is that the worst one then? Malignant narcissist is terrible. Is and, and narciss- That's what you called me. I'm too sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> you are my little malignant <laughs> narcissist, darling. <laughs> Love you. <laughs> <laughs> I see he's got all the all the types written down here. Yeah, keep going with the, the psychopathy of Megan. So it's 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 adjacent <laughs> it's adjacent psychopathy because we're saying so as as external to the person with personality disorder, what the judgment is, because it's it's socially based, is you're awful. Every environment you go into, you leave a stink behind and you make everybody feel used and exploited. It's malignant. You're, uh, so the proper term nowadays for psychopath is antisocial personality disorder. But for lay people, if you go antisocial, that means you're like sitting in your room. What they're saying is any and all social interaction is going to be nasty. They're nasty with everybody all the time. They're not pro-social, they're antisocial. They don't add to society, they only subtract. So that's somebody who's subtracting from society, fundamentally a, a, an, an immoral uh, parasite. All right, I'd like to spend a bit of time on Megan, Megan and Harry yes. Now, she is an apparent pro-social, pro-social narcissist. She mm. does a lot of, you know, good things and is attached to a lot of good charities, mm. yet she is perceived to be an absolute nightmare of a human being. Why is mm. that? Um, the pro-social narcissist is aware that uh, 
they can create an image that functions as a kind of shield for their own poor behavior. So um, they will make, a, a true pro-social narcissist will make actual sacrifices and will do actual good work in the world. Um, but it is so that they have that shield for their poor behavior when they're called out on it later. Like, okay, yes, I did this, but look over there, I did a good thing. So I, I believe that she would genuinely be investing money. I believe that she genuinely would be trying to help people. But the point of that is to garner narcissistic supply. It's not to help anybody because for somebody like her, there isn't anybody else in the world. There is her. and it, She's the center of the universe. And this is why she had to be with you know, royal a member of the royal family. Oh, does she even know who's royal? Oh, who's oh, royalty? Didn't. I didn't even know. <laughs> yeah, that's why she has to be with somebody who's important. I mean, you just read that as one of the nine traits. They have to be with people who are a certain social status. And did she know it was going to end up this way, though? The I whole think, world practically hating her. No, no. She thought that she would be uh, beloved. She thought that she would be the next Princess Diana. And that's why she targeted him. Also for his weakness. I mean, God love him. Like, she would have seen the mother trauma uh, there um, and that he is kind of a baseless uh, individual. He's a fish out of water. He's the second best. Um, it would have been enormously easy to, to manipulate him into the position that he's in now for her and uh, low risk and high reward. So she is a smart psychopath. She has made a, she's made a good choice and a good judgment there. Her narcissism, however, her delusional grandiosity made her think that the British people would love her the way they loved his mother. And the opposite is true. I mean, largely speaking. Because I believe where she went wrong was falling out with Kate and William so early yeah. on in, obviously, in the, her relationship with Harry. Yes. She, obviously, if we were advising her as psychopathic advisors, we would have said, listen, you've got to control play your impulses, game. play the long game, um, be humble, look at, look at Kate. Even if you don't feel like her, just do what she does. It's a life of service. It's a life of service. You are a soldier. Do that. Be of service. Do your duty. That's what the royals like. That's what the Brits like. That's what it is. Um, no, she wouldn't. There's no fucking way she has the patience and impulse did, control. Did she manipulate that situation with William and Harry then? So, uh, Will, uh, William and Kate, so she could get control, more control of Harry? Possibly. So if we assume that she's uh, done it uh, cleverly, she would have done it so that ultimately she gets more control of Harry. But then to play devil's advocate, did she need more control of Harry? And maybe it was just narcissistic injury, narcissistic rage. She just couldn't stand the fact that they were always going to be more loved than she was. They, they, she never had a chance. She just, I think she just misjudged. And then she got a lot of negative feedback. And because she's very fragile, that sent her into a narcissistic injury and a narcissistic rage. Do you think she got confused that Harry would some, somewhat someday get the throne and she might be a princess queen? I don't, I don't know. I don't... Maybe her delusion doesn't quite go that far. I mean, she must have known how, like, statistically how incredibly unlikely it is. I think she has made the, some correct judgments Um in America, British people and British royalty mean something that it doesn't mean here. And there is a huge fascination abroad. Like you go abroad. I remember a bit, I can't even remember what country I was in. And it was a, a Charles's coronation. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I was in uh, a, a Czech or, or maybe it was Spain. Did you watch it? People were saying to me, I was like, no, why not? You're English. Why do you just sit there glued to the television watching and being crowned? I'm like, because who does that? That's like, we did. did well, I, I, like, because we were commenting on it. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, 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 it's your job too. And no, no judgment against people who did want to watch it. That's fine. But there was this, they watched it. The Spanish watched it. The Germans watched it. The Americans watched it. And they were appalled that I didn't watch it. They're like, isn't this a historic moment in your British history? I'm like, well, the role is largely symbolic. I mean, it's not, it doesn't, it's great. Like it's cool. It doesn't change anything, but it still has that magic. It still has that glamour. So I think the way that we would have Hollywood on a pedestal, but people in LA would be like, Bleh, who cares? It's the opposite is true, but for the, for the Royals. So she was right. Like it put a center stage uh, for a while, but just not in the way that she really wanted it to.
do you think she's the reason behind Harry releasing his book Spare, exposing his brother? I mean, that is such a woefully miscalculated book. And uh, either he's, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I, like I look at that and I think, has he gone completely mad? Is he totally effing deranged? Um, she must have been a huge driving force behind that. I think he's essentially her sock puppet for now. Like her hand is deep in his bum. Because it started off, didn't it, with the Oprah. The Oprah interview was first. Mm. Shortly after, they started going on, I think it was James Corden. And then the book was released. And then finally, she didn't get invited to the coronation. I mean, what sort of a power play was that? Uh, to not invite her? Is it because too much of attention would have been drawn to her? Um, well, they've they've said that they don't want to be royals. And I think it's... A, a, I'm not pro-royal. I'm not a royalist. But I have to say, like, what do I think of um, uh, of, of our queen who recently died? And I was like, she did a really, really good job for a long, long time. Um, that was pushed on her. Nobody, you know, do the royals make bad decisions? Sometimes, but most of the decisions they make seem perfectly rational. Those two humans said they don't want to be royals anymore. Okay, you're no longer attending a royal function for royalty in which somebody is made even more royal than they already were. You said you're not interested in it. So of course we're not inviting you. Inviting you how? Where would you stand? You said you're not royals. Where are we going to put you? What gown are we going to stick you in? What magical hat do you get to wear? You're not royalty anymore. You can't wear the special hat. <laughs> you didn't cut that bit. He did though, didn't he? Prince Andrew, didn't he wear the Order of the Garter? He did, yeah. And that, the, you know, the logo for that is only Swaki Mali Pons, which means it's only bad if you think it is. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely cutting that. Definitely cutting yes. that. <laughs> so if she is a narcissist, Meghan Markle, mm. what is Harry? Is he an empath who's been traumatized by Absolutely the not, I don't think. death of his mother? I don't, I, I really, really don't know. I don't know. I, I could say that, like, he's been way too uh, permissive way too unboundaried, way too grateful for whatever he thinks he's received from her. I don't know what she's saying to him. I don't know how she's mirroring and future faking him, telling him that she sees that he's the better brother. I don't know what he needs to hear, uh, but but she's saying it to him. Um, would I go so far as to say he's just a codependent, empathic type who's going along with it? I couldn't. I couldn't say that because if you look at his history, there is a pre Meghan Markle, pre MM Harry who has his own history and his own story, and there are some performative displays of pro-social narcissism within his backstory, as there was with his mother. I mean, sorry to say, like um, some of the things that she did were performative and they were virtue signaling. Maybe she was a nice person, maybe she wasn't. I never knew her personally. But there is that element there. There always was. So be raised as a royal then, like Prince Harry, does that pressure and that abnormal upbringing create a completely different kind of personality type? I think it must do. I think we've got to look again at that context-based narcissism. Um, for the grace of God, go we all. I don't know what torture that is like. I, I, I don't sit there saying, oh, well, you've got loads of money and you're really famous. It must be effing brilliant. No, I imagine it's fairly awful. Um, that is, as I, as I said, it's a life of servitude that you didn't choose. And you can't escape it unless you denounce yourself as a royal. That's the, on, that's the only way out. It's like leaving the mafia or something. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that it would make most people quite mentally sick, though. I mean, who... You know, the, the, like the fame that you've experienced, you you were you were already a fully formed adult when it happened, and you came up not too fast, right? Like it was fairly well paced. This quite, channel started in two thousand and seven, right? So, and the blog started in two thousand and four, and your first big book release two thousand and ten. It's all been gradual, slow, so gradual. Progress. And there was, there, there was a big Vice documentary as well, wasn't there? Was it Vice? Nat Geo, Nat Geo, yeah, Nat Geo. So. I always look at like what age that happened. If it's after 25 and you've already had some fairly hard life experiences that have already tested you as a human being, you know who you are, you know who you're not, you've had your wild party days and all of that. And then, it, and then you're, you're rising slowly. You don't get the bends because you're coming up nice and slow. He's been 
as, as a kid, he's been in like front page of the newspapers and people are looking in his socks that he can't pick his own nose without perhaps taking the, it, it's, you know, um, it's a hard life. People probably get annoyed with me saying that. You wouldn't want it. You wouldn't. You might look at it and think, "Oh, it's all just parties and and wealth." It isn't. It isn't. They 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 are duty bound, and they've got people pressuring them all the time. Is that why you stepped down? Because of that pressure. Part of it. I, for him, probably it was a calculation of saying, "Here's all the pressure. Here's the reward." Uh, he probably thought that for years. Now he's got a girl with him who's also encouraging him. She's not going to get what she wants from the scenario. She probably was pro-royal until she realized it wasn't going to go away. And she's like, oh, uh, this lot, uh, they're racist. <laughs> Let's go. All right, darling. Yes, of course. We'll go with mummy's lip balm for my todger. <laughs> <laughs> That's in the book, right? You put his mum's lip balm on his yes. todger. Aging yeah. Dr. Freud. <laughs> Do you think day. that she has depleted... The, she's maxed the depletion of the resources 100%. from him and she's going to move on. I, I can't see a future in this. And that's where that's where you see more of the classic narcissist codependent formation. Uh, as I said before, like the, the narcissistic psychopath was narcissistic psychopath. It's actually quite stable and it actually has longevity because they can take turns and they can find victims together to consume. If it's, if it's truly narcissist with codependent, even if you get 20 years, the codependent is going to be worn out. They'll, they just start to physically die. Have you seen some of the pictures of him coming out of clubs and stuff? And no. he just looks frazzled. Does he? And like, it's recent. Yeah, yeah, recent. And you you mentioned, you know, from your own experience, you just felt you were frazzled. It's a nightmare. You can see it in his eyes. It's like, a, it's, it's like, a, it's like an ongoing adrenal exhaustion. Like, you, you're constantly under threat, but there's nobody to... You can't run. You can't fight. There's no... It's not... It's, it's 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 like psychological torture. It's bloody awful. So who do you think is going to pull the plug first? Do you think it's going to be him or her? That's a really good question. I think if she thinks the ride that he's given her is exhausted and she has a better option, um, then it would be her. But, hmm, being married to a royal, even if he's a former royal, that's a hell of a passport. A hell of a passport. Samantha Markle said she would only be satisfied if it was like she was the president and a billionaire or a billionaire and she was the president of America. What, yeah. The, the yeah. It's got to be something waiting. bigger than a royal. How yes. can you get bigger than yes. a royal? Yes, yes. And even then, with the way America is with class and nobility and royalty, there's a kind of, there's a kind of jealousy that Americans have. There's a thing that, that we have that they can't. And I get it. Like, I sympathize totally. I, I'm not anti-American. It's titles versus wealth, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. You said it. That's exactly, I was going to say it in about five minutes. You said it in a much <laughs> nicer way. It's titles versus wealth. You can't buy it. So even a billionaire, mm, that's pretty cool. Startup billionaire, well, there's a few of them. He's a royal. He's a royal. Like, if you, so that might mean something in less classy places. But if you're around, you, she's been around Europe now. Europe's a different thing when it comes to class. You can be anywhere in Europe and be like, this guy was a member of the British royal family. It, it's going to open more doors than any billionaire can. But surely going for someone like Elon Musk. Now, I would personally, yeah. if I was her, hit yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. It's bit of the, the old Elon. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Again, it's, it's the perception of the royals from America versus the UK. Because in America, young women are raised on Disney, the mm. castle, the prince. Mm. So psychologically, that's, that's in there from a very young age. Yep. And no matter how rich people get in America, they can't buy mm. a, a, royal, a royal. They can't. It's, it's not something you can purchase. It, is, it goes back thousands of years. These bloodlines go back thousands of years mm -hmm. and that is something, look how long America's been around. It's something that they can't compete mm -hmm. against. But I'm just saying Elon Musk, he's one of the most powerful man in, you know, men in the world. In a crude, capitalistic way. Yeah, I don't. in a refined, they, see what they, yeah, royal bloodline they way. Have, they have this lust for refinement. So uh, if you spend time, uh, it, it, oh God, Americans are not gonna <laughs> like this. So Americans will say to you, with all good faith, go and stay in this hotel. It's beautiful and it's really fancy. And you'll go there and you'll be like, this is a shit version of an Italian hotel. Yep. It's really uh, chintzy and sort of fake and like... Cheesy. Ugh, I sound like a European snob. 
or they'll say this restaurant is really classy and you'll be like, oh, is this what you consider to be? <laughs> this, this would be, you could walk up a high street in a Greek island and find better food than this. It's very hard for them to get that. And it's not just America. In Asia, it's the same. In Dubai, it's the same. They want that European vibe, that European essence, that European class. And it, you know, as smugly we can sit here as Europeans going, well, we've got everywhere. We've got loads of history, loads of titles. They can't buy it. It's really frustrating for them. But in defense of Americans, and I'm half American, I was there for 16, 17 years. When I go, when I went to America, the, f the four, five star resorts, the hotels, yeah, and you come to England and go a five star, a four oh, no. five, and it look like they need a refurb. They all do. It's crap. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, I think you could clean. Yeah, I think she was traumatized when she found that because this isn't <laughs> Disneyland. She would have gone to some of those castles. It's the royal family. They're not infinitely wealthy. And she'd have been looking. She'd be like, that safe is a bit old. This <laughs> is old. The floor's creaky. That car's dirty. She's wearing clothes that look like they should have been bin 15 years ago. <laughs> and that's what, but British toffs are a bit like that anyway. They don't want the best of it. I don't know why. Like it's a flex past a certain level of money. The flex is to be a bit dirty and disheveled because you don't care. Now, if I was her coming from her background, I'd be looking at that going, ew. I should have gone through one of those uh, Saudi princes. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 perception and and it's what you're attached to, I guess. Um, she may well she may drop him, but I think this is how we got into this this conversation. Is there's that magic of um, being British royalty and the fact of her ethnicity as well. I've had Black American clients, female Black American clients, saying to me three over ten years of working. There's something about because of the Disney movies, uh, a, a white prince because they're they're always they're always white and they're they're typically set in a European style if they're not actually European and they've said like there's a power to that that's what we're raised on. Believe me, when my aunt was taking me to the nightclubs when I was sixteen in America and introduced me as Paul McCartney's nephew, mm. I was playing that. I was playing <laughs> that to the max. <laughs> not quite a prince, but still, but still, it's up there. It's up there. That's that's also British royalty being a Beatle. <laughs> so when. Um, Harry's said things like, with the paps chasing us, mm -hmm. I'm fearing now that something like ha that happened to my mum could happen to my wife. Mm. Is this genuine concern? I, I, he shouldn't be saying things like that. It's extremely distasteful. And he knows perfectly well that that's not likely. It's that, that is, I'd, I'd have to hear it in context. But the way I'm immediately responding to that is that is a very crude callback to what his wife wants to be associated with. Please put me in a sentence comparing me to your mother. Okay, um, here it is. The paps chasing you today could do what the paps did to my mother. How? Like, come on, dude. Like, you know, she was killed by MI5. We all know that. Cut that. Because <laughs> we are. Well, we just interviewed Lee Sansom, Princess Diana's bodyguard. Oh, did you? Yeah. The, and one, the one who was, in the, who was in the car? No, he's friends with him. Oh, okay, okay. But he has all the inside on it. Ah, and he told us a lot about MO5, so you're not far from the mark there. Oh, you won't cut that bit then. Shut yeah, up. we'll keep that in. <laughs> Watch. I'll put, I'll put the link in the description box with the Lee Sanderson Princess Dennis bodyguard interview, and they were. Um, she was under surveillance, and they were following her. You know, mm. all all the time. Oh, he, really? He would go out and and knock on the window and say, "Do you want a cup of tea?" To them. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Well, I mean. Uh, yeah, I, I think I, my my opinion of, of what happened is that that I, I don't see personally, I don't think that was an accident. And she she predicted it. She said, if the brakes on my car go and I die, you'll know why. She, Princess Diana said that in a letter to somebody. There's a lot of different theories. We've had everyone from David Icke on to Lady Colin Campbell. And mm. There's just so many different theories. But do you, do you think it was an accident? You personally think it was just a random accident? Me, no. No? No. I think that there was a... Uh, circumstances came together. There were vested interests that wanted her to go. Mm. In Princess Diana, her own words, she says, I fear I'm going to be in a car crash and uh, they're gonna, I'm going to die and they're going to make it out to be a car crash. Mm -hmm. um, there was the pressure from the paps. There was... Was alcohol involved or not? The bodyguard is saying that alcohol wasn't in involved mm. and the, the official story is... Um, bunk so I'm the kind of person who just 
looks at all the different theories and tries to remain independent. He sits mm. on the fence a lot. Yeah. yeah. I'll have to watch that interview with the, uh, the bodyguard. Yeah, that's that's, that's, it, yeah. That sounds really interesting. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think if it was an accident, there's, there's too much weight to it not being. And just like what she was doing, it was too much of a provocation. And who she was doing it with at the time that it happened, it was just too much for the establishment at that time. You got to remember, people have to remember how quickly the world has moved on. This was pre 9 11. Mm. It was pre um, several wars in in different countries and pre ISIS. And um, if there was a map drawn somewhere and a plan drawn somewhere that meant that they knew what the next 25 years would look like, then the optics of it would mean that you can't have a royal family member who now has a Muslim. Um, Multi millionaires' child walking around. You, like, I'm not. I, I'm not saying I agree with that. That's completely psychopathic and evil to think that way. But that was the state of the world at that time. And that's one of the theories. And I will talk to you about that afterwards. So Lady Colin Campbell came on, and mm. she gave us the accident theory side of it, and she was quite compelling. Mm. David Ike came on and give us, you know, all of the Freemasonic and the, the names, the angles of this. Or the which reptilian. Is, which also was mind-blowing. So you hear all these things and you, you, your brain just wants to explode. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's fascinating. Love David. I still, uh, I, w I work at Iconic every, every w once in a while, like every six months or so. I do something with his sons. Um, and I've been reading his book since since I was a kid. I just love hearing his perspectives on things. Because yeah. I always walk away from him and be like, wow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Whatever you think, he'll just turn you into another dimension. You'll be like, wow, yeah, what what are we looking at? It's like taking acid or something. Like, wow, <laughs> it could be like this. <laughs> yeah. And David's on saw. There's 10 dates coming up. Google it. Check it out. Get tickets. That'll be well worth um, it. He's an amazing public speaker. He is, yeah. Are there any other conspiracies you look into, Richard? um m most of them most of them yeah, yeah. no i uh um i don't i i always say i'm an official story denier i'm yeah. not a conspiracy theorist i can't tell you why people are doing things but an official story denier the official story of the nonsense the official story of yeah, we've got to, got to stay off it. That on, Let me change That's the subject. That's my favourite. Cut that, cut that. <laughs> Let me change the subject. Um, do you think there's a, there's a conspiracy right now mm -hmm. That the Hugh Edwards story uh, was time to come out with, with all this stuff going on with Boris Johnson. Do you think there's any and veracity there to that? There was a leakage of it, the WhatsApp on the day of the party, you know, the big party at number 10 they had during lockdown. What, so the theory is that they've released this story to sort of muddy so, the waters from to, Boris? To swamp the attention. Swamp ah. the attention from the big... Uh, number 10 party, lockdown party. It's entirely possible. It's entirely possible. I mean, I mean, I wouldn't even, I don't even know if I class that as like a conspiracy theory. The media works this way and the people, uh, the politicians who want to control the perceptions of, of the public, we know that. I mean, that's what PR firms are for. That's what spin doctors are for. It's not a conspiracy theory. There are people being paid millions of pounds every year to do exactly that. And I would do it if that was my job. I would 100% do it. It's not nice. It's not kind. It's not what the media is there for. That's an exploitation and an abuse of the media. But I would do it if it was my job to. And it's, my friend at the BBC said to me last week, he said, it's not what they report on that you watch out for. It's what they don't. Yeah. Mm. So you look at that submarine that exploded, um, imploded, sorry, mm. a couple of weeks ago. At the same time, there were, what was it, hundreds of, immigrants sinking on a ship yes. outside of Greece yes. that didn't get reported didn't on. Didn't get but into these, the news. No. Not, not with as much emotion and passion anyway. Were the people who got on that, that submarine narcissist <laughs> or psychopaths? <laughs> fearless. Uh, they were certainly, nuts. certainly fearless. I mean, there's just no way. I mean, you, you if you had amassed all of their wealth and handed it to me and said, get on that tiny tube and be dropped. What, were they to drop like a, a kilometer and a half? We had a guy on who'd been on it. Oh, really? Arthur, German guy. And um, he was saying about the safety, how lax it was and all the things that went wrong on his his mission to go down there. One of his mates was on the one that, that didn't come back. Oh, one of his mates was on yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it's heartbreaking. So... 
I can see why people would want to do it. And if you're a, mil- a billionaire and you want bragging rights to the, with the boys at the club to say that you've been and seen the Titanic, I understand, but not like that and not in that vessel. I mean, that is just insane. And what I would be looking at is if any single thing goes wrong, what's the contingency? It's like a homemade thing. What are you going to do? What if you radio up and you're like, oh yeah, the electricity's gone. How's it? Nice. Okay. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> awkward. There's not, there's, yeah, this is an awkward combo. You hang up. <laughs> I mean, there's, the, the, it's, it, it almost feels like a, um, a, a narcissistic contempt for the environment. The sea is so incredibly fucking dangerous. And the idea that like, oh, we'll call in the Coast Guard. They'll rescue you. Like, how? What? Look at the arrogance of the guy who's running that company. He went yeah. down with the ship. Yeah. Well, he was confident. Yeah. Or was he a psychopath? I think I I don't really know people like this, but I know people who are a couple of echelons below. They've never really had anything go wrong in their lives. Everything they do is like touched with gold. They're sort of rah, rah, yah, yah. Let's go. Come on, chaps. Let's go. Everything's going to be fine. Oh, no, the electricity's gone. And then they probably wouldn't have even had the chance to say, oh, no, the electricity's gone. They would have gone, oh, look. Done. And then it would have you know, just collapsed around them. With that kind of pressure, I'm sure, thankfully, they would have died very, very quickly. Um, pro- and I hope they didn't know what was happening before it did. Um, but yeah, I, I just think that they thought they were immortal. It's it's like these people have these fascinations with going to space and obviously going on mm. that vessel. Mm. I mean, why do it? They've got all the money in the world. Is it just to be extreme? I... I the, there's a weird human compulsion, and I think this is where we started. If everything is going too well, and pr- probably nobody in this room, I certainly haven't experienced it, but we can imagine what it would be like to be ultra successful and reaching the peak. Something inside of you would be like, not this, it's too much. Let's do something. What should we do? Let's uh, ask someone for pictures of themselves with their tits out, or let's snort a load of coke, or let's go to space, or let. I have to ruin this somehow. I think there is, um, Freud called it uh, Thanos. It's a death drive, like a a drive to destruction. And I think we all have it within us. That's interesting because in the conclusion of my book, Two Tonys, The Mafia Philosopher, which is a a real story, he's facing death. He's about to die from cancer. Mm. And he goes on a monologue about people who climb Everest. Mm. And he's saying to be the to be on Everest where you could just die at any moment mm. for some people, that is what makes them feel most alive. Mm. Mm. I, I, I can see it. I can I can empathize with it. Like, you know, there's challenge, you want to overcome, there's risk. Um, but you just, you know, like that some of these things I just I, I would rather read a good book, thrilling book. Like you said, we've gone back to the beginning. We've not talked about elite deviants, mm. whereby if they do have all the power in the world, do they have all the money in the world, increasingly as they get that, you know, they're doing, they're utilizing it to get their frills, but the reach is a saturation point. Mm. So they've got to then realm into the taboo. Yeah. Do you think that plays a role in these TV presenters, etc.? I think so. I think... Um You've got to have risk for there to be stimulation. And I suspect, like we said before, if we said there was some narcissistic psychopathy going on there, which I can't say there is, but if there was, it would become obsessive. It would become a fetish. Like I have to do the terrible thing. I have to do the dumb thing. I have to do the risky thing. And I have to bet everything on this, you know, this one card that could ruin my entire life in order to feel. Because it might be quite boring. It might be enormously numbing to live uh, the life of a of of a Hugh Edwards, the same life day and day. Now go in. Now read these words. Now look at the camera again, again, again. You're amazing. You're brilliant. Everybody loves you. Maybe just fuck this. What can I fuck this? Fuck this nonsense. Let me do something crazy. Let me do something. And I I can I can understand that. So elite level deviants where they've taken their appetites and just stretched them and stretched them and stretched them to the point where yes, the only thing that is going to cause them to feel anything is uh, doing things that are really perverse or really boundary breaking. It makes sense to me. I can't see why they can't figure out that the thing to do is to hit the, the serotonin dopamine reset button. Like just take a break. If you, if you're eating and eating and eating and you're full, take a break <laughs> to go do something else. And when you come back to it, 
it's going to feel good again. You'll, you'll feel something again. It's incredibly lazy and one dimensional to just think, no, I just have to do worse and worse things. And do these deviants not think that everything coming out of Hugh Edwards, will that not stop them from doing it again now? Seeing how easy it is to be leaked online for all that, you know, for it to come out in the press and ruin their life. Mm. Is that not going to stop someone? Are they, are they addicts? I, I think it already has curbed an awful lot of behavior. I suspect that a lot of human behavior now is is much more curtailed than it used to be before social media and mobile phones. Everybody's carrying a video camera in their pocket and it can live stream it straight away around the globe in 4K. So yeah, a lot of human behavior has changed. And yes, there is this addiction element to it. There is a conditioned addictive element to it where you need that buzz. You've got to have that high. And so you have to do the terrible thing in order in order to get there. And um, yeah, it can only lead to self-destruction ultimately because like what you're doing in order to get the buzz is is reputation damaging. Like I have to do a reputation damaging thing. I, I have to say I've never hit a very high level of success, but I do get similar impulses sometimes. Success can be quite ominous. It can be quite a drain. And I think like, what can I do to just totally... Da- and I just have these fantasies of like... Do you get the urge to sort of put a really outrageous meme or quote or oh, I, something i i get that quite frequently I on get, instagram and i have to stop myself and go yeah. that would get taken the wrong way yeah it's, it's almost like a kind of a, a psychological Tourette's. i used to have this terrible thing when i was younger where i would um sweat and tick sometimes like my face would tick because i wanted to do something terrible i remember sitting up meeting a, pe- a girlfriend's parents when i was 19 and the girlfriend's father was was uh was bald and they served me mashed potatoes and I really wanted to take the mashed potatoes and jam them on his head. And I'm sat there going, so don't, don't move, just keep still and just sweating. Like, and she was like, are you okay? I was like, yep, I'm fine. So what's wrong with you? I was like, I really want to jam this on your dad's head. <laughs> and I would get, I'd get that impulse. But now, yeah, absolutely. I have these like protracted fantasies about how could I utterly destroy my own reputation? And I think, I think even success is a kind of a, is a kind of a prison. And we still, as human beings, the crazy little creatures that we are, we still crave chaos. We still crave conflict. And if things are going too good for too long, we go we go a little crazy. So, so with Schofield having a meal in public with this person who looked really young, would mm. that be part of what you just said? It's, it's, there's only, it's, so if he'd had a, a meal in public with somebody who looks really young, there's only two things. He's either going for, fuck it, destroy everything, chaos, or I'm so... Uh, watertight and I'm so powerful I can do whatever I want and nobody can challenge me it can only really be one of two things I think I think the latter and we see you know if Savile had been around in the internet era like you said mm. wouldn't have got away with most of the stuff that he did these guys um, have been exposed for doing certain things and allegations but we have seen the mainstream media clunk into gear and seize the narrative and, and say, oh, it's their private life. It's no big deal. It's just like mm. a man going down the pub and meeting someone who's younger mm. than him. Uh, it's nobody's business. There's no, you know. Mm. Um, so there's still those old school forces at play mm. to protect these people, which they rely on, obviously. Yes, which is what, that's what we saw with Savile for, for decades, wasn't it? And I do, I think you're right with social media. I always wonder like, what would Savile have been like? I think he would have bragged. I think he would have, he wouldn't have been able he to put teasers out left, right and center. Yeah. And 100%. he would have got caught way, way faster. Um, Cause it's, everything is faster now. So yeah, I think, I think um, seeing that clunk into place. Yes. I, I, I hear, I hear what you're saying and it has to be called out where it's seen to just say, look, we live in an era, the culture is moving towards a kind of moral relativism. And that's partly psychology's fault, at least in part, because of the, the things that work in psychotherapy, the psychotherapeutic environment, it's sacred. We shouldn't have moral judgment. If you're going to open up to me about how you feel and what you really think, it doesn't help you at all for me to go, that is morally wrong. That is morally good. It doesn't help you. But that belongs in therapy. In the real world, you have to have moral absolutes. Socially, we have to have absolute moral standards. You can't be messaging people who are not of age and asking them for for this and that, like to show their bits. You just can't do it, man. You just like we have to have strong um, boundaries on this. We have to 
you know, I may be a little bit old fashioned, but like, I think we have to protect children because they're children. Children cannot consent. We have to protect women. Why do we have to protect women? Because men are physically stronger than women and they can make demands of them that they cannot refuse. You could say, oh, that's misogynistic or it's like too patriarchal or whatever. I'm like, it's a fact of life. Kids can't consent. They can't protect themselves. Women are not as strong as men. They can't protect themselves from men. We have to do more to protect men. And And that's why we're campaigning for bigger sentences and the justice system to go on people who harm women and kids and Mm. let all these low-level drug users out and refer them to mental health because it's such a waste of resources. Such a waste of resources. So do you think that moral relativism, it's improved in some areas, but it's gone to extreme in others? For example, go woke, go broke? That's a fine example of where... um, Poorly understood Marxism, poorly understood psychoanalytic theory, poorly understood radical leftism and postmodernism have come together into just a mess, a total mess. And that's mainly, sorry, in my humble opinion, run and kept alive by people who are simply mentally ill. Most of these people show all the hallmarks of borderline personality disorder. They should be in therapy. They shouldn't be engaged in politics. They're not engaging in politics. They only think they are um, woke as we have it now, like modern woke, not the not the original woke, as we have it now, this bad mix of Marxism, radical leftism, and, and psychoanalytic theory, it's just a mess. There's really nothing there, and it the the reason I no longer fight it, I, I used to make videos against it. I don't now. I think it's a self limiting virus. Uh, there's no reason to fight it. That will eat itself very quickly now. The guy, the Titanic guy, went down with his own craft. Um, they traced his social media history and his previous public statements and in one of his statements he said we no longer hire 50 plus year old ex-military white guys we're we're, we've hired uh, diverse young people because they're the ones you hired a tiktoker (laughs) that's who you want running the safety of a submarine that's going to go down to 1.5 kilometers under the sea that's who you want a tiktoker never mind those (laughs) highly experienced ex-military engineers and veterans be they of any ethnicity and why is he talking about ethnicity anyway? It's gross. But t- TikTok is a, a far superior with PlayStation controls, which is what was true. running the craft. That's <laughs> true. Yeah. So he, had, he did. He did have. So he did have some thinking there. That that is one of the things I find really appalling about modern wokeism is it's so crude and it's so rude. I just think it really isn't nice or necessary to talk about some, how much melanin somebody has in their skin. And like, unless we have to have that conversation because it's relevant with like sun cream or we're talking about skin cancer, why should I address how much melanin you've got? It's none of my fucking business. It's, it's really strange. And they say they're not racist, but they spend all of their time fetishizing race. They say they're not sexist, but they spend all their emotional energy fetishizing sex and gender. Um, it's just racism and sexism via the back door as far as I'm concerned. And lack of identity, latching onto something external. 100%. Well, it's so, a bit like the people out there who say, on oh, name no names, who are saying men can have periods and men can also breastfeed, apparently. I find that incredibly insulting to women. I, well, I, I, I asked the question since day one, where are the feminists on this? The feminists should be should be rallying against this ferociously and vociferously this isn't these are anti-women statements that is women having their space taken from them again it's referencing history by men mm. that we've just found a new way to do. see men have adapted we've we've become cunning we found a new way to do it and not only can you not say anything against it you have to support us as but we it's, do. it's absolutely disgusting because i know in next month when i give birth my mental health is going to be absolutely fucking screwed mm. i'm going to be exhausted i'm going to be drained because my body is doing all sorts of things that you know that naturally it's meant to do but at Mm. the same time I'm going to feel crap and I'm going to be breastfeeding my child Mm. and then someone has who cannot do that Mm. that activity they cannot Mm. can go out there and say oh yes look look at me I can breast like breastfeed a fucking child Mm. I it's probably the biggest insult I've ever seen in my life online and like you said there is no women actually sticking up for it at the moment which is incredibly frustrating i i think in fairness it is getting stronger it is getting better there are there are more women there are more men and women who are pushing back against this and in fairness up until now if they tried like three four years ago you would just be eviscerated online and you could lose your job now 
the temperature is changing a little bit and i think everybody's agreeing like it's going too far it's too far way too far like these are not that's not a woman that's a, i mean that it's not like you it's not like the surgery's perfect this is surgery that's in its infancy it's experimental and it's extremely damaging if it was absolutely pitch perfect and it was just like you cannot a doctor cannot tell the difference between your genitals between your body if we look at your corpse uh, post mortem it is the same okay it's, it's nowhere close it's nowhere near that and it won't be for uh, you know the foreseeable future no. so you know we we like it's it's facts we have to face facts we have to look at data and this is just an anti data anti fact anti science movement these people are thugs so we've learned a lot from you today, Richard. Mm. In conclusion, then, I just want to make sure I understand these different types of narcissism. Here which we go. One, which one did you just say you were? Just with this. Jokingly, Jen. Right. So you, <laughs> so you, you said that malignant is the worst. That's the psychopathic one. Yeah. What's the difference between overt and covert? Oh, God. You do this at the end. <laughs> um, <laughs> Should we to get my iPad out? I might have to delete my PH history. So if... Um, Overt would be pro probably better termed the classic grandiose narcissist. Here's the classic grandiose narcissist. They're arrogant, they're extroverted, they're outspoken. They think they deserve special attention. And largely speaking, they can convince the world that that's true. So, so they, histrionic. They can be highly histrionic as well. So that's, but they're... They're, they're kind of adaptive to the environment. They're largely successful. They want narcissistic supply. They can find narcissistic supply. They could say they can convince 70 to 80% of people that they are beautiful. They are the most intelligent. They are the most charismatic. These are successful narcissists. The covert narcissist struggles to do that. They're not pretty. They're not that bright. They're not that charismatic, but they still feel the entitlement. So they used to be called vulnerable or fragile narcissists. Mm. So they're harder to detect. And that's where covert Ooh. came in. What if you piss one of them off? Oh, you'll have an enemy for life. The resentment, the resentment and the violence. They're more violent than classic grandiose narcissists. And they're impossible to spot. They're very hard to spot. It takes a lot of exposure for you to twig that you're actually dealing with a vulnerable narcissist. They will apologize. Mm. They're, they're typically more introverted. They're not so extroverted. But finally, across time, you'll see that all of the conversations ultimately are about them. Mm. They're not the brightest, smartest person in the room, but they're the biggest victim in the room. They're always the most persecuted person. You know, their pain is greater than any pain anybody else has ever experienced. It's falling into place now. A few people have met. Okay, I can past. see the recognition. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Ah. <laughs> what about an antagonistic narcissist? These are people who, oh God, what a fucking nightmare. These people are. <laughs> these, <laughs> these, these motherfuckers. No, if, if you're with an antagonistic narcissist, they're drawing narcissistic supply from uh, arguments and from from being oppositional so right. any position drama queens. drama queens they'll say that they they love to be they'll be like i love to play devil's advocate i love to challenge people on their beliefs i love that and they'll give it a veneer of um is it one of those people who say i just say it how it is yeah yeah that kind oh. of thing you know i'll deliver <laughs> yeah, then, like harsh truths <laughs> tough love but actually what they're thriving off is winding people up they really really love winding people up and they don't stop Communal narcissists. A little bit like the pro-social narcissist. It's, it's, um, it's trying to find uh, narcissistic supply, but through, through the commune, through the group, through the collective. And that's, that's the way of coercing the narcissistic supply. So would they have to be extroverts? They would need to be comfortable communicating with people regularly but even an introvert could probably bluff that one these sound quite nice yeah well they may become uh, become outraged when they witness injustice or see someone being mistreated they don't apply the same level of scrutiny to their own behavior they just sound a bit relaxed rela like a relaxed narcissist <laughs> is that the least harmful then uh, they're still narcissists. They're, they're still, they're still, ultimately, they're still narcissists. I mean, this is not a description of a different personality disorder. It's more a description of a tactic. So the 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 the, the strategy is is communal. 
So they were, you know, there's the, the five big ones, but they've added on these two, the adaptive versus the maladaptive. But it's also the seductive, yeah. We'll get to that one. Okay, maladaptive versus adaptive. Your This points to the heart of a big ongoing controversy. So as I said before, I follow the American Psychiatric Association Diagnostic and Statistical Manual uh, definition of narcissism. And there's this argument going on, is it adaptive or maladaptive? So if it's adaptive, it's of benefit to the person who has the personality disorder. Because it's protecting them from future trauma. Yes, and it and, and acquires them a better looking spouse and makes them more money and means that they're more secure and healthier. It's adaptive, it's good for the person who has it. If it's maladaptive, they're gonna end up a drug addict, they're gonna end up homeless, they're gonna end up destroying their own lives. So then there's this question within psychiatry and psychology, which is, well, hang on a second, how could a personality disorder be adaptive? The guy who headed up for the uh, DSM-5 edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, there was a committee of 23 people who wrote the Narcissistic Personality Disorder section. And the guy who headed that, whose name escapes me, when Donald Trump was brought into power in 2016 and people were saying, that guy has a narcissistic personality disorder. This guy who headed up the committee for NPD and the DSM came forward and said, no, he can't have narcissistic personality disorder. Why is that? Because he's successful and it's adaptive. And if it's only hurting other people and doesn't hurt him, that means it's not a personality disorder, which had people like me with our jaws drop. Like, did you really just say that publicly? So this is an ongoing argument that needs to be resolved within psychiatry and, and psychotherapy itself. We need to decide, are personality disorders adaptive or maladaptive? I personally don't think if anybody has an adaptive personality disorder that we can call that a personality disorder. It doesn't, that doesn't make sense to me. But can't you be, it could be helping yourself but hurting others at the same time. If it's, so here's the thing, if it's, if it's, uh, did you say hurting yourself and hurting no, others? Sorry, it could be helping yourself while hurting others. If it's helping yourself and time. hurting others at the same time, that's probably narcissism. And I personally would class that as maladaptive. Um, so if it's, if, if it just, if it just helps you and hurts others, it's like that Johnny Cash song, you can run on for a long time. You're going to, you could end up in prison. You're going to end up or, or outcast by your tribe eventually. If it's hurt, hurt, helping you, but hurting others, you'll get caught. Because it's a parasite, isn't it? Your resources are my gain. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And that's more of a, we're back to psychopathy there. Then there's the flip side of this argument where people say, well, what if it only hurts the client, but the client leaves everybody else alone? That would be borderline personality disorder. And they'll say, oh, that's a quiet borderline. And I would say, no. If the person is non-abusive and they're just on their own suffering massive panic attacks, fighting with ideas of suicidal ideation and so on and so forth, but they're perfectly pleasant to you or they'll say to you, listen, I don't feel good or I can't talk to you because I have my problems. They don't exploit, they don't abuse. That's not a personality disorder. That's PTSD, that's CPTSD. That's a traumatized person. For me, for it to be a personality disorder, it should hurt the individual and hurt the people around them. And it should be permanent, pervasive and personal. It, sh it shouldn't be context specific. It shouldn't be something that you naturally grow out of. It is something that is actually quite rigid. It's quite resilient. And it's especially resilient to therapeutic intervention. And does the narcissist also fall align, um, in align with the Maya Briggs personality types? Um, it, it could do. I don't, I don't Maya Briggs. Because of their pers obviously the color coding of their personality. Yeah, what would be the, what would be the Maya Briggs uh, per narcissist? There's so many reds. different ones, isn't there? Well, there's the red the, the colors. So um, mm. extroverts, uh, generally red yellow mm. and you've got the blue green which are the introverts mm. so if you, if your personality type say you fell into a a red yellow personality type you usually have two colors instead mm. of one on its own mm. then you'd be a more extroverted narcissist interesting interesting i don't um the thing with maya briggs i find it interesting like personally um but when i looked into the clinical research for it what I'm about to tell you was was clinical research based on data that they gathered in corporate environments. So if they went in for the day into a corporate environment and said, hey guys, we're doing personality, here's a Maya Briggs personality test. They found that the scores over a six month period, if they came back six months later, could be as much as 50% different. Mm. So people are coming in in a certain mood 
and answering the questionnaire a certain way, then they'd show up again six months later and be like, well, you should be exactly the same on the Maya Briggs personality. And it, the deviation could be, as much as, could, could be as much as 50%, wow. which is, I think it's an interesting way of analyzing people. And I love hearing what people's you know score is and what they got. But it's not, it's not very stable. So a lot of businesses use that. So would you suggest they instead use the narcissist test instead of perhaps the Maya Briggs? I don't really know why, why it's so popular in the corporate world. I don't know what the point is at all. Like, I, <laughs> like it's a fun day out, I guess. They should be learning like neuro-linguistic programming, state management, how to be happy, how to communicate well. The Maya Briggs thing, it ain't astrology, but it's not, it's not stable enough based on the clinical research that I saw for me to be like, wow, this is a really good way of gathering great insight on who a person is. <laughs> I've got a little side story on that. So I was in the maximum security Madison street jail, 2004, Phoenix, Arizona. Mom sends me the Myers-Briggs uh, book. Test. Surrounded by idiots. Surrounded, pardon? Cause it's surrounded by idiots and surrounded by psychopaths, two books. I was surrounded by murderers at this point. Cause they were nearly all <laughs> oh, murderers. Right, no, the <laughs> yeah, in, in the Max security, it was nearly all murderers. So I, I do the test and I, I, I'm, I'm on the phone to my mom in the day room telling, you know, blah, 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 excited. This is really interesting. And they're all listening. And then I go back to the cell and they're all like, come one by one. Come, yeah. Can you do the test? Can you do the test? <laughs> I did the test with all these murderers. And I was like, next, we we're writing home saying, these guys brag how much they lie to the therapist and play the system. Yeah. If only the therapist could get the hand on these results. <laughs> this is the most authentic test ever done in the history of psychoanalysis of murderers in America. I, 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 <laughs> I tell, you, I tell you, I started, I was really lucky. I said before, nobody gets work in psychology. I got work with the probation service and I was in Runcorn. And I was like, we had cognitive behavioral therapists dealing with uh, cr like long-term criminals who were criminals to feed their drug addiction. And I've never seen such naivety. God bless them going in and being like, well, I questioned our client, criminal, uh, David. And he told me this and I'm like, do you think it's possible that David, the fucking drug addict, robber, <laughs> might lie to you to get work. No, no, not David. I know him very well. We have good rapport. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Their attitude is whatever we tell our therapist in prison is going to go in a file and be used against us. Yeah. Well, they ain't wrong. <laughs> <laughs> they ain't wrong. I mean, that, that's, that's why I saw these guys because they'd already played the system to the point. They were all claiming like mental health issues. They should have been, I think the particular people I was, I would deliver lectures to them. I was 21. You can imagine what that was like. Cognitive behavioral therapy uh, based lectures. Like the next time you think of taking heroin, think about the consequences of your actions as if they were going to sit there and go, fucking hell lad, you know what? You're right, changed my life. Eight hour long lectures I do with them like that. But you can see like this, um, this, this interaction between the the psychotherapy kind of a more of a nerdy academic super naive outlook and then hardened street criminals street criminals just eat them alive yeah they didn't have a chance they were there and they had to do 10 one hour sessions and if they failed or they didn't show up they go straight to prison kind of a thing it's like your cell is made where they're ready mm. for you but they didn't want to send them because it's so expensive so they just came to do therapy sign them off like oh yeah i've done my therapy today i'm gonna go they were smoking crack in the breaks <laughs> i'd say to the boss i'd be like you're smoking crack here we know just let them <laughs> fine fine whatever gets you through your day <laughs> there's, there's one more type of nurses ones you ask you about um so a colleague of mine uh, started coming to work two or three years ago we're in over the knee boots. Oh yeah. Is that an example of the seductive narcissist? No, I'd say sexual psychopath narcissist. <laughs> <laughs> I'd probably back you on that. <laughs> what is the seductive narcissist? Um, I think like the it's it's the it's crossover with the what I referenced before, sexual narcissism. Look, like I think in order to gather narcissistic supply, you'll use what you've got. If you're really, really bright and you're a hyper intellectual and you can get into a position in the academic uh, superstructure, that's what you're going to do. If you're sexy and you're pretty and you're handsome and whatever, sex is power. It also offers access and status and all of these things. And humans will signal to each other. They'll signal sexual availability to each other. They'll signal... Uh, uh, sexual status to each other and this is this is a game we play humans are highly sexual mammals i would say you trapped me with work and it was more like stockholm syndrome 
just, what he did was he flexed his status on you. I was like, look at how many YouTube subscribers I've got. Like, he did, and out. I didn't even know who he was. I was like, oh, that's nice. Was that the day we went Waitrose, wasn't it, with the masks on? And we went to Waitrose during lockdown. We were not doing anything you're not meant to be doing in lockdown. Yeah. And yeah, Tom <laughs> recognised him with his mask on. I didn't even know who you were. Jim wasn't aware of the oh, oh, really Even with your mask on, they, they'd seen yeah. you. Yeah, oh, are you sure now? And he was oh, like pumping it up. Jim's yeah, eyes yeah. wide, didn't that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It changed colour. It's, <laughs> it's evolutionary biology. It's evolutionary biology. You want the high status male who's recognised in the commune. I mean, it makes sense, you know. It's I good. need my Elon Musk. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> that thing you said then about the seductive uh, narcissist, Meghan Markle is an element of that. Bringing is that what she brings to the table for Harry? She might have. She might have a fetish, surely. I, th I think like with with a lot of these different definitions of narcissist, I'd, I'd re-emphasise. I kind of skipped over it before. There's one narcissistic personality disorder. There's not multiple. These are these are. I wouldn't even call these different variations on a theme. These are different strategies, basically. Because mm. I've had people come to me and be like, "Oh, he's he or she is not an overt; they're a covert." I'm like, they might have been on that day. You know, like if somebody's at the top of their career as a rock star, they can afford to be an overt narcissist and be a diva and make these demands and treat people like shit. When they're on the way down, they can't. So the the vulnerable or fragile narcissist, they have to deal with uh, narcissistic injury all the time and tremendous feelings of shame. Fragile covert narcissists know they're entitled and they know they're delusional. So they're actually a little bit more aware. And I think the shame that they feel is what makes them potentially more physically violent. This is based on the research. Particularly, they're more prone to domestic violence than classic grandiose narcissists, particularly towards animals and children. Mm. For what reason, I don't know. But you know who else that vectors in with? Psychopathy. So, you know, we said before, how do you tell the difference? We do have differences, but we're in the realm of like immorality, criminality, highly goal oriented behavior. People who are prepared to do what it takes to get what they want through manipulation and so on. They're often comorbid. They're, the diagnoses are often comorbid. They often cross over. So how on earth do you get out of a narcissistic relationship with the least possible fireworks or harm? Um, oh, good question. That's, that's a great question. It's a question for the ages. It, you, are, you are going to be harmed and there will be fireworks. Um, the first person to work with, your brain will be telling you to focus on the narcissist because of the amount of pain they've caused you, the intrigue, the deception. Everybody who's been the victim of narcissistic abuse, the way I know that it's really narcissistic abuse, my little trick, when people say to me, I'm not sure if I am. If they show up and they've turned themselves into a private investigator and they're obsessed with like recording data and facts, that's highly likely to be narcissistic abuse. It's not just that the person made you feel bad, it's that the person made you feel like you were losing your grip on reality. So you're trying to find ways to hold on, you're making notes, you're taking voice notes, you record conversations you have with them because they so frequently lie and backtrack and gaslight. So it is gonna hurt, but you have to work with yourself first. You've got to emotionally regulate yourself, take care of your physical health, take care of your emotional health, go to therapy, find a good therapist or a coach who really understands narcissistic abuse, start talking to someone who is, an, who is a professional, who's an adult, who's not your mate, who's not your mum, who's outside of the situation, who really understands narcissistic abuse, and then make your plan. And it should be a practical financial plan, not a psychological one, for you to be able to live in a space that is not with them. Because slowly, slowly, over time, the only thing you can do is to break any and all contact with that human being. Any and all contact with a narcissist is an opportunity for them to abuse, manipulate and brainwash you. And you can't afford it. It doesn't matter what stage of your healing you're in, you can't afford it. And that just twigged a cautionary tale with me as well because Alex Reed's our friend and he went out with Jordan, Katie Price. Katie Price oh yeah. And things were recorded during that relationship by her of a sexual and embarrassing nature mm. that then she weaponized when after they broke up. So would mm. narcissists during the relationship put things in the arsenal? They're already planning ahead to destroy you. Are they that far-sighted? Yeah, I, th I think so. And uh, in the co for for the context of her and the life that she's led and the background that she's come from and 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 everything else, it wouldn't surprise me she was doing stuff like that. What a bleak. Um, world she must be living in to do that with with a new boyfriend and yes she probably was expecting things to go bad 
Um, and she probably was expecting things to turn nasty. And guess what? You know, um, I, I, with this kind of thing with relationships, I always look. I'm not in a relationship myself. It's 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 an absolute flipping war zone. The dating scene now, <laughs> fucking hell. But what I try to remind myself, and I try to remind other people, is look, it's love. So love requires intimacy, and intimacy requires vulnerability. Who wants to be vulnerable in an aggressive confrontational space? You have to have safety. It's not sexy. It's not fun. It's not a five-star holiday that you can enjoy, but you have to have safety and you have to have the capacity to have open conversations without things becoming unsafe, without things becoming dangerous. It, it sounds a bit boring, but it's that's what's required. We're going too much nowadays just for stimulation and stimulation and excitement is not safety. And so it's an, it's, I would claim it's an anti-love environment in many ways, which is a terrible shame. I agree. Any further questions, Jen? Um, so you're interviewing Sean, obviously, when he's on his way home. Mm. Why is that? Was he a massive narcissist when he was a drug lord? I would say a psychopathic, malignant, histrionic, <laughs> fragile narcissist. Yeah, <laughs> sadistic. Well, he is sadistic. Listen, I've seen his, yeah, eye, seen I've seen his eyes twinkle. <laughs> Go back to the story. Tell me about the part where you're in Tell pain. Me, Mom. <laughs> Tell me, Mom. Where would it tickle you the most? Is Hannibal Lecter? Hannibal Lecter a witness? So it's very likely he's kept some of those on. To this, no, I've, I've been forced to mature and Absolute self reflect rubbish. and evolve as a human being from my 20s, Jen. Just transcended. I acknowledge that behavior was narcissistic, hedonistic, but I like to think that I've evolved from that. <laughs> look at the look at me like you're going to kill me. <laughs> I see your eyes change, your color, they're going darker. They're not. Absolutely rubbish. <laughs> Has James, the cameraman, or Joe, the sound engineer, thanks to them today, got any questions for Richard? Anything you'd like to throw out there? It's been a very fascinating subject today where we've learnt a lot. I think James, James is... I think James on the verge yeah, of something there. Go on. I, I was thinking about Jimmy Savile earlier. And, um, you were talking about someone, and I think Jimmy Savile was like, yeah, change charity work. Do you mm. think he was doing that as a cover? Oh yeah, communal, social. Yeah, pro-social, communal, 100%. Like, he can always hide behind uh, charity work and he can guarantee that people will stand up for him. And people did. People did stand up for him. Say, well, look at what he's done. Look at what a nice guy he is. Um, look at what he's done for all these kids. Look what he's done for all these people. So yeah, 100%. 100% he was doing that. So yeah. for the viewers watching, what telltale signs would they have to watch out for to not get involved with a narcissist? Um, I, do you mean romantically? Knee high boots. <laughs> he's like, really I, got a we'll thing go with for romantic. these knee high boots. <laughs> <boots. laughs> yeah, he's obsessed. Just let him wear them, sort them out. Um, you haven't seen the red ones yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they really make my eyes pop. Um, oh, what an image. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, well. Oh. Um, <laughs> telltale signs I think I think well, like so so nowadays uh, there's a lot of like cult, um, culturally motivated moral relativism and we live in a boundaryless time like boundaries are almost becoming a taboo and the thing is with boundaries like politeness and like formality and showing people respect yes it takes more effort and yes it can seem a bit like fuddy duddy and whatever but that is there to protect people that's there to protect us from each other. That's why we have formality. That's why we have boundaries. And I would say to people, if it's a romantic relationship, a business relationship, or a friendship, have your boundaries in place. Know what you want from the interaction. It's okay for you to say, I have things that I want from this interaction. That's not narcissistic. That's sensible. Some people are not qualified as a girlfriend or a boyfriend. They don't have what it takes. Some people are not qualified as a boss. Some people are not qualified as friends. You have to look at that and you have to be realistic. It's not fun, it's not sexy. It's much more fun and sexy to just be impulsive and live in chaos and just go with the flow, man. But that's how you end up on the rocks. You gotta be careful. Your time, your attention, your care, your resources, your love, they're precious. We only have so long on the planet. Um, and I really think like, I'm very, very hopeful I don't think we need much as human beings. I think we need each other. We need nature that's there already. And we just stop, have to stop acting like such massive twats and everything will be fine. And yeah, I've got one last question, a personal mm. one. So how do you stop two narcissists from raising a narcissist child? 
No, he's going to be a narcissist. <laughs> <laughs> Accept it. Make him the best narcissist he could possibly be. Possibly. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Please let the viewers know where they can find you, support you, get your book, get your courses, etc. cetera. So, um, you can get my book, A Cult of One, from uh, Jeff Bezos' House of Slavery, Amazon. <laughs> uh, my website is richardgrannon.com. I'm very active on Instagram, which is uh, Richard Grannon, and uh, my YouTube channel, which is also helpfully called Richard Grannon. Um, so yeah, if you want to contact me there, there's loads of free material, loads of free courses you can get. So I'll see you there. Thank you. Huge thank you, Richard. It's been fascinating. We've learned so much. Um, just you know i said i'd already heard that story twice that you there was a centerpiece of this and hearing it again there was so much more detail in your emotion as well i'm sure you viewers really felt for richard as he was describing these things let us know in the comments what you thought let us know in the comments what you've learned or if you've got any other questions and if you'd like us to go further down this road of getting people on who are experts in these fields and i i find it fascinating don't you i Jen? do i do yeah you're pushing to get more people like Richard on, aren't you? As soon as I seen you on True Geordie, I was like, you, you seem like such a fascinating, fe fe uh, fascinating fella, but now I'm like, you're just, yeah, average. Average, average, <laughs> average <laughs> capture. <laughs> we finish our podcast with Cheers. a voice, brother. <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome. thank you. Thank you. Jump up. Cheers. Yeah. Thank oh. you very much. Oh, yeah. cheers, yeah. wonderful man. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, brilliant. So Gadfly Press is hugely proud to announce the publication of Killing Escobar and Soldier Stories by Peter McAleese. If you've not seen our podcast we've done with Peter, check it out. And the book is now available worldwide on Amazon in all formats. And Peter was hired out of Scotland, mercenary by the Cali Cartel, to assassinate Pablo Escobar one of the most famous gangsters in the history of the world. The mission is all detailed in the book, as well as Peter's many soldier stories from various countries and continents of the world. So mind-blowing, gripping, as seen on BBC TV. This is the book, the story that Killing Escobar is based on, Peter McAleese's testimony. The link will be in the description box below the video. Available worldwide on Amazon. Cheers. I kill you! I kill you! A knife and a cost and all that, like. Yeah! And he's looking at me, and we went white, and then he's gone, like. <laughs> <laughs> what is it about a tough guy that fascinates us? Imagine I'm hearing that, I'm thinking, I'm not going down today. If I go down today, yeah, I'm dead. We're bringing you the very best of our interviews with Britain's hardest men. They made the mistake of bringing billy cubs, iron bars and knives to a gunfight. No rules fighter bash, Stephen the Devil French and my best friend, Wild Man. Over two hours of terrifying tales of punch-ups, stabbings. That's what happens in that world. You, you leave people long enough, they get enough rope chain themselves. Attempted murders and exceptional all-round hardness. <laughs>